Visiting with Huell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Well, hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser, and here we are at the LA County Fairgrounds Fairplex here in Pomona. Obviously the fair is not going on now, but something else very interesting is going on over here at the fairgrounds, and that's what we're here to investigate. We're gonna spend the whole afternoon here. Here's our uh, tour guide right here. Introduce yourself to everybody, Hi, Bob. I'm Bob Tui. I'm the coordinator for the Fairplex Garden Railroad Volunteers. The and Garden it, Railroad. The Garden Railroad. It's a historical railroad that's been here since 1924, Hugh, and at this present location since 1935. Now look at this, because I've always heard about Garden Railroads. This is the first one I've ever seen. You say it's been here since 1924. What's the history of this one? Well, the history starts with the really starting in 1924 in a tent. Uh, from what we understand, there was a request from the Corps of Engineers for a high school teacher to, to develop a uh, replica of the Pudding Stone Dam and along with Pacific Electric Railroad for their venture out here to see if people from Los Angeles would come out here and use the dam area. They did that for the 1924 fair the criticism they got was that the uh, train, the little trolley they built, didn't run. From that point on, he went back to his school teachers and they started working together. Uh, the original trains were built by the students in the different shops in those days, and they developed a railroad. Now, did you tell me that this was the first garden railroad in the United States? Well, we're not sure it's the first, but we're quite accurate on knowing that it's the oldest and the largest uh, garden railroad in the United States and possibly in the world. You... Oh, wait a minute. Here comes an Amtrak right here, right through the garden. Now, where did, can we walk right through yes, the... Yes, you sure can. Where did they get the name Garden Railroad? Well, now wait a minute, we have to step right over the... That's all right, you can walk right on them. You can you walk, walk right on, on the tracks. No wow, oh, look down here. Oh, this is great. We got the Golden Gate Bridge we, down there, only it's the green. It's green and it's also got a train running over it, so it's... <laughs> It's a little unusual, but it was a donated bridge and we accepted it. And here comes one of the trains right here, right down the track. Wow, this is, oh, and here's another one over here. Look over here, Cameron. Here comes another one. That looks like the, uh, the old Zephyr. That's the old Zephyr. Look at this. This is amazing. And it's all kind of, uh, Look, you've got a, a, a river running through right. here, uh, trestles. Uh, it looks to me like you've almost got little bonsai trees out here. Yes, they're not really bonsai. Uh, we have women and men that work real hard on keeping them shaped down and into trees. They'd be a regular tall bush or tree if they didn't do that. Look at this. There is so much going on out here. It's so neat to just look out here and see this whole situation. This is a, a huge area you've got here. That it is, that it is. We, uh, if I may, I, I'd like to just draw your attention over here to, uh, to behind you. We have a theme here, it's called California Discovered and the role the railroads have played and our, our purpose is not only for the public education but to develop a uh, program for elementary schools to have a value to come out here and, and learn about California history. The mountain, as you look at it closer, has all mining and logging operations. There's a little red car going right here, isn't it? We also have, represent the Pacific Electric Railroad here because they played a very important role in Southern California. So we have a Pacific Electric Railroad that is serving the, the pier in Long Beach, and we also have the, the Pacific Electric, which serves the entire railroad, which runs across. You'll see the other cars running out here. Now, are we stuck? Are we at the end of the no, line? not at all. We can walk right across here if you'd like. Well, I feel like I'm going to be stepping on something here. But you say it's okay to it's step okay. right on the tracks. It's okay. Can we walk down this you way? You certainly can. Boy, this is, I don't know what I was expecting, but this is a huge operation you've got going here. It's the size of a football field. It's 100 by 300 feet. Plus, it also looks like something that requires 
a lot of work. We have 80 volunteers and we put in about 1,200 hours, a year, or 12,000 hours a year uh, volunteer help out here. Let me talk to this lady over here. She's working in the garden. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine, thank you. Introduce yourself to everybody. I'm Mickey Tui. And you're and trimming I'm the trees. trees. Yeah, they look like a bush if you don't trim them, so they gotta be a tree. So you take a bush and turn it into a tree. That's right, I did those yesterday and these today. And how today. did you get hooked on this garden railroad thing? <laughs> well, we had a railroad at home and then uh, started coming out here and this is my husband, he's the coordinator, and I tag along. Oh, this is your husband here. <laughs> so you had to go along with this. Well, thing. I enjoy it. I don't do trains, but I like the gardening part, and I do um, uh, some of the scenes and some of the little people and stuff like that. And who decides what the new scene is going to be? Because I'm sure it's constantly changing. Well, is there a big debate and vote by the board to decide what's going to be added and what's going to be changed? and? It's somewhat, we have sort of a committee, and they, there's a, a plan, you know, it has to be California, mm -hmm. and it has to fit into the scene. So we have, we built on a three-year plan, we've passed that, now we're on another three-year plan. So, wow. So we're just adding, hopefully more industry and more big buildings now, so. Great, well nice to meet you. Keep working on your tree there, that's I looking will. good. thank you. <laughs> Boy, this is, look at this one going right through the, over the bridge here this is this is so much fun now i know we can't well yeah we could walk over yeah. the dam we can walk through there if you'd like before we do i'd like to point out that part of the uh san luis ray mission is here we have an exact replica of the san luis ray mission uh that has been at this site that we know of since 1972 because we found pictures in a newspaper the problem was the one that was here has totally deteriorated. We have a, a craftsman, you'll meet him in a little while, I'm sure, that has been rebuilding it. These are the pieces that have been rebuilt. And here's what your wife does here. Yes. Is to make these bushes into trees. That's right correct. Here. Hugh, this is our, uh, one of the two interactive areas that we have for the public and, and children of all ages. What do you mean uh, interactive? There, by the fence line there, there are three control buttons. And three of these loops that you see here in the old western town uh, actually are operated from the fence line, so the public can actually operate these trains during the fair. I don't see any trains. No, they're not out today because it takes us quite a while to set it up, and we only set this up for the fair. Okay, so this is really at its peak during the L.A. County Fair that is, every year. That is correct. That's our main show. At that time, what you see out here running today is just a sample. Uh, we have 21 different units running at one time during the fair. Oh, my gosh. Look at this one. So you have 21 trains like this one well, operating at one time that's correct. during the fair. That's correct. Trains and uh, of various sizes and of various descriptions, uh, six of which are operated by the public. Wow. Look at this. I don't know what I'm... Look, I'm just... You know, I've never really thought I was that big of a model train bus. But now these aren't model trains. These are bigger than model trains. This is what is known as the G-gauge or the garden size. It's the fastest growing model railroading uh, in the United States right now. There comes your logging train right there. There's the logging train going across our mountains through our snowshed. Sorry I keep interrupting you, but this is, this is the first time I've seen this. This is very exciting. Well, when the fair comes on, what you're seeing is a lot of vacant areas here that we put buildings and scenes out. So it's entirely uh, manned with buildings, scenes lit at night. Obviously, this is your desert this area is, here. This represents our California, Arizona, Nevada desert border. So you've really got the whole California thing laid out here. We, we do, and we're still developing uh, those scenes to be reminiscent of those years. Now, there's yeah. another guy working up in the... I, I was expecting more people working on trains. So far, all I've seen are people working doing landscaping around here. Well, we do have to do a lot of landscaping because uh, the weeds grow pretty fast and uh, the trees grow, so it's a uh, constant trimming and weeding, really. Where are you in California right here? Well, this really depicts the railroad's contribution to uh, the logging industry and the mining industry, so it would be in the northern central part of California. The railroad, of course, uh, help bring the logs to the mill and the finished lumber to the market and also supplies to the uh, mines. You're definitely in the forest. Uh, exactly. And exactly. this is definitely in your blood. Uh, without a doubt. How often are you out here? Uh, probably more than I'd 
I should be, but I, well, probably two days a week, uh, maybe really? three sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. All year round. All year round. And does it build the closer you get to the fair? Well, yeah, it does so because that's kind of your, your your goal is to put on a show for the fair and the people for the fair to show what this railroad is all about. Oh, now wait a minute! I can't. Well, I guess I can just step right over right it. Over. Nice to meet you, nice sir. To meet you. Your name is John Collins. Nice to meet you. Just walk right over the. Uh, oh, you could have stepped, stepped on the tracks. See? Yeah, but there's something weird about stepping <laughs> on these tracks. I'm worried that I'm going to break them or something. <laughs> no, that, that, they'll, they will stand it. They, it's designed to be put in a person's yard, uh, various sizes, and, and to be out all year round. All, all, all the buildings you see out right now, with the exception of one or two, are out year round. Uh, then we put the additional ones out for the fair. So there's your train here, and then here's another train. Oh, that. You have all the sound effects, too. Yeah, that engine has the sound effects in it. Look at this. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's just so aesthetically pleasing to Thanks. look at it. Yeah, we, uh, well, we like I say, we try to make this a year-round event for the fair. Uh, they have a tremendous amount of shows here for the different shows during the weekends, and uh, we, we want it very pleasing for the people. Even if we're not running, we want them to enjoy seeing it through the fence. The little houses, the little cars, all the little buildings. Now, we're walking, I don't know, oh, wait a minute, you got oil derricks over We got oil derricks. Oil was a very important part of the uh, California history, and that's being developed. As you can tell, it's just a sample that's up there. When we get that hill uh, developed, they'll be actually operating oil wells uh, we won't be pulling any of that magic gold up out of the ground, or that, but uh, but they will actually be operating, and, and that'll be all done. That's how we start. We start with an idea, and we start with the ground the way it is, and we start developing from there. Okay, we've come inside what they call, this is the cab, right? Right. Your name is? Andy here. And tell us what it is. This looks like Action Central right here. Well, it is most of the time. Uh, this is where we control the four main loops on the layout. Uh-huh. And uh, we can control up to eight trains on the four main loops. So you could mess things up if you wanted to, could Very, you? very easily. You have to keep your mind on what you're doing because right. you're just like a real uh, switch house for a real railroad. You, you've got to make sure that things are going in the right direction and that they're not heading into each other. That's, uh, we don't have a problem with head-on collisions. We have a problem with them catching up with each other and uh, tail-ending each other. Do you control the speed in here as well? Yes, we do. So you're the guy? Yeah, I'm the guy. Well, here's another guy over here. Your name is? Steve. And you're here to show us what's in this cabinet. This is what controls and responds to all of the uh, controls on the panel. These oh are my God! A couple hundred relays and uh, uh, old technology, some brand new technology from the 50s to the 90s and into the 2000s. So you're constantly updating it. Yeah, and uh, it wears out. Stuff we run so much, it just wears out, and we have to replace certain things. So, so are you the computer guy? Uh, part of it, the electronics, and others help uh, do this, but we all learn different trades. So, so. that's kind of interesting. There are different needs. There are oh, different yeah. skills right. that different people bring to this. Oh, yeah. We have uh, telephone uh, uh, people, I'm an aerospace engineer, really? and uh, it takes some of all of us uh, to do that. So there's just half a dozen electrical specialists here, and we do mostly this, but we watch the trains as well. Look at the trestle. Yes, this is a very magnificent one built by a company in Phoenix. The man has a uh, awning shop that he builds metalwork for awnings, and he got into this hobby about four years ago. He heard about us up here. And he didn't want wooden bridges, he wanted metal ones. So this is made out of metal. This uh, suspension bridge is metal. The others are our typical wood uh, trestle type bridges. So that's a wooden trestle. That's a wooden trestle bridge is representing more of the olden part of California history. And of course, the uh, metal bridge is coming into more modern. And here's a guy who's not happy with just cleaning out his pool at home. He has to come work on the weekends here at the Garden Railroad, your name is? My name's Rick Bremer. And I guess that's part of it too, isn't it? You gotta keep the lake and the river and the streams clean here. Yeah, it is, Joel. We have 23,000 gallons of water 
and about five major ponds with about four minor streams that feed in and out. We have about three different pumping systems, so it takes quite a bit to keep it supervised. See, this is amazing. I mean, when you think about all the different aspects of what it takes to make this thing whole and complete and, and connect all the dots. And that's the nice thing about this group, too, is that everybody works so well as a team. We've got a great coordinator, and we've got just really good team members that work together, and everybody gets along. We have a great time. Now, to keep you motivated, though, they do give you other things to do than clean out the water. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm a cabinet-making teacher, and I teach uh, I teach a film and animation class at Sandy Miss High School, so uh, I also do all the cabinets and millwork and things like that for the group that we need done. Wow. And do you know anything about trains, per se? <laughs> yeah, oh. I've picked up a lot from these guys. <laughs> I mean, what got you started with this group? Well, I met Bob Tui through another group that we have in Fullerton, and he took me out one Saturday morning, took me on his personal tour, and then that was it. I was hooked. This will get you hooked, yeah. just coming out here and seeing this. I'm not even really a hardcore train person, but this really get you excited. There's something about this that goes beyond it just being a model train going around in a circle. Yeah, well, it is, too, and we like to keep in focus that we're a display for the fair, for Fairplex also. And so we, it's more than just a train set. It's a display that we try to uh, bring our focus through to the community and show our, our uh, theme. So there comes a coal train, Union Pacific, Southern Pacific, Great Northern, uh, Santa Fe, coal train going over the Golden Gate Bridge, which, as we have already noted, is not historically, that, that has never happened. There are no rails going over the Golden Gate Bridge, but that's okay. You all can take a little bit of license. We take a little license on that. Uh, uh, we thought it was a beautiful bridge that the gentleman was building for us, and, and he built it special for us. And uh, it We're is going to turn it down. We're not going to turn it down. Nice to meet you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. All right, let's just keep walking because uh, now the deal is uh, anytime you come out here to Fairplex, even if you're not uh, open to the public, people can stand around the fence here and look in and see all of this from, from right at the fence. They sure can. If they're here for any other show, any type of display, or any program that the fair has on, and if we're here working on the Garden Railroad, we'll always be happy to bring people in when we have the time to do that. Uh, trains aren't always running. Quite often we'll have maybe one train running because it helps the people work a little better. Yeah, kind of motivates them a little bit. Boy, look at this. This is as pretty, this is as pretty a view as I think I've ever seen. And you know what? I've been to the fair a lot, and I don't think I knew this was here. A lot of people didn't know it was here. It had deteriorated pretty bad before 1997 when we came in as a volunteer group and started renovating it. Uh, and they also, during the fair, they have a lot of food booths that kind of block the view of this. So if you didn't know it was back here, it would be easy to miss. But it's right in the main center of the fair. If they look at the clock tower, we're right there. But this is good enough. Look, you got a little airport here. Yes, this is an airport. In fact, you're standing on a runway here. Oh. Oh. Oh, well, you had to have a mini mall, didn't you? Yes, we sure did. There's a mini mall. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a great addition or not, but it's part of what's happening. <laughs> it's part of California. What's happening in California. It's part of days. California history. And uh, we get down here, and we've got, uh, well, we got two guys standing down here. Fellas, you don't need, you're not even breaking a sweat. You're supposed to be working today. Well. This is what we do, though. We, we like to watch the trains while we sweat. <laughs> <laughs> what are your What are your job descriptions today? Well, I'm the manager of the switchyard area here. I designed it, and I made the mistake of asking our Tully and our coordinator, we need something to show up the general public how trains get switched in the yard. He says, fine, you're in charge of it. Open mouth, insert foot. <laughs> so this is your whole, look at this, Cameron. This is fascinating. This is a whole switching yard here. And there's the roundhouse down at the end. Down there, uh-huh. And I have a, the ice, is, ice house is down at the far end. It extends down. In fact, we've got, I have it automated here this year. We have an electronic genius with us. And he uh, automated this uh, track where we've got two trains running. Okay, here comes a train right here. 
How, how do you know? Watch it, Cameron. You're standing right on the track. <laughs> how do you know so much about trains? Well, I spent 40 years of my life with the, in the railroad industry, 29 years with Santa Fe, and I was in uh, engineering, construction, and design. Didn't get to ride the trains. And then I worked for a uh, private railroad contractor for 10 years doing so the same you're thing. You're one of these hardcore guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you hadn't told us what you're doing here today. Well, I'm in charge of this whole area in front line here called our central theme area. And uh, this is to depict uh, sort of main uh, street USA, if you will, and uh, all the buildings, the hotels, theaters, mini malls, churches, and that type of thing. So the responsibility is divvied up. Certain people are in charge. I keep thinking I'm going to derail a train <laughs> a lot here. Of that things comes happening by. here. There is a lot of stuff going on. Do you? Is is there kind of a hierarchy? The longer you've been here, the more responsibility you get. No, I think it's like uh, Bob said over there. You open your mouth, you insert foot, and that's what you get to do around here. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're you're so. one of the big wigs. Well, I'm also uh, help. Amtrak. Yeah, I also help Bob uh, keep track of. Uh, our budget allocations and our expenses and uh, all the projects uh, that we do throughout the year, each because year. Because this isn't cheap. No, it's not. Uh, these are big boy, uh, big, big. People. Little toys for big boys. There you go, that's what I was Little saying. expensive toys yes. for big boys. Yes. You know what is so interesting about this, we're back we're making the, the, a second loop here, and yet I'm seeing things that I didn't see the first time. There's a lot to see here. Yes, there is, and, and keep in mind that this is just a fraction of what you'll see during the fair. Yeah, because you've still got a lot of these things to set up. That's correct. We have a lot of things that don't come out uh, except for the fair. Now, where does this rank in the hierarchy of garden railroads. How good is this one? If people from other parts of the country came to visit, do they make a pilgrimage to this one because it's one of the early ones and, and one of the one of the good ones? Yes, they really do. And of course, we'd like to think it's the best in the world, but I'm sure there's other people who would have other other thinking thoughts on that also. But they're garden railroads all over the country. All over the country and all over the world. Uh, and we are known all over the world now. Over the last five years, we're in national publications. And we do have people that call from all over the world, as well as all over the states that are going to be in California one want to come see it. And the fact that it's been here in one form or another since 1924 makes it a very historic place. It certainly does. And we're very proud to be part of that history. Was it revolutionary in 1924 when it opened up? Yes, because everything in 1924 was all handmade. This is all product that you can buy now on the open market, but in the original trains all the way up through 96, those are all handmade and uh, one of a kind. Now, I don't think we've really talked about the difference between these trains and model trains like you would have at home, because these are a little bigger, aren't they? These are bigger from what people are used to, which they call the HO or even the old Lionel uh, old gauge. This is the next size up commercially from the old gauge, and people do run them in their house. They run them around the ceilings and through walls. But you see them in restaurants. You sometimes. see them in restaurants. So this is very popular, and we're told that this is the fastest growing of the model train hobby. Uh, of all the models, this is the fastest growing. But these you buy as completed units, and then some people take and modify them from there. But if somebody in your family starts getting hooked on these little trains, you better be ready to shell out some money, because this ain't cheap. It's not cheap. Your engines run anywhere from uh, a minimum of $200, $250, uh, all the way up to thousands of dollars, depending on what you want to buy and who you want to buy it from. Uh, all the manufacturers that are making this today are, are very reliable manufacturers. Yeah. What is this supposed to be out in front here? Well, that's just our main lake, our main river. We have an island over here that we have a young man that's about 12 years old that's going to be developing that into an island resort of some sort. So you give, you farm these things out for people to develop? We certainly do, and of course we... Oh! <laughs> Whoa! Now see, I, you got to be on... 
At least I didn't derail a whole train. You certainly didn't. And actually, I didn't even derail that truck. You didn't derail the truck, and it's coming around. There's another truck, as you see, coming around now on it. And uh, and these will operate all day long on the battery. It, they don't wear down. And oh, so as, wait a minute, that's a battery operated. That's battery operated. Yes, that's that's the battery. Trains are are um, are track operated. Off the power off the track. Boy, you got to be careful when you're out here. You can imagine what it would be like if everything was running. Well, 21 trains 21 at one time. 21 different units at one time. Boy, it is just a beautiful, beautiful place. I never knew it was here. Well, we're very, very pleased and proud to have you here. And uh, we're just excited about it. We always are. It's a labor of love, as you can obviously see. And, uh, and we love it. And sometimes we look at each other and say, are we really having fun? But that's our key word, is if we're not having fun, what are we doing here? Well, this is a wonderful, wonderful place. It's been here since 1924, been at this location since 1935. And of course, you're real, you all kind of took it over and started really revitalizing it in 1997. That is correct. And, and we have a group now of 80 volunteers, and you just see a fraction of those people here today. And I'm very proud of them. I'm very proud to be part of that group. And a wonderful job. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, we've seen them do everything from clean the water to, to, to uh, do the landscaping to working on the trains themselves. That's right. There's something here for everybody to do, and there's something here for everybody to see, especially during the three weeks, September the... 13th through the 29th this year. Okay, but it's always three weeks in, in September, September, the L.A. County Fair. Come out here. Ask anybody, they can direct you to the place. Actually, we're very close to the grandstand. We sure are. And uh, it's here for people to see in all of its glory. And uh, boy, it is a, this would be a wonderful place to, I mean, how many people see this every year? Well, we have a fair. Well, exit interviews indicate that between 65 and 80% see this, and that's 1.3 million people total. And see, I was one of those 20% that never even, I didn't have a clue that this was here. <laughs> well, we're going to try and get some more attraction things up, like flags or something, over time so you can spot it easier. Well, it's been great. It's called a Garden Railway. It's called the, a Garden Railway. The, 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 real, the name for this particular one is? Fairplex Garden Railroad. Oh, it's pretty simple. Pretty simple. <laughs> it's a very complex railroad setup with a very simple name, and it's a wonderful part of what's going on here at the L.A. County Fairground. Thank you all very much. And there it is, this Garden Railroad. Come out and see it during the county fair. And of course, it's here year-round if you want to just stand and kind of peek over the fence. This wonderful little railroad, this Garden Railway in Pomona. Visiting with Huell Hauser, made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. purpose or a, or a nutritional purpose? Uh, all of the wild plants are more nutritious than uh, their conventional farm-grown plants, yeah. but the lettuces in general are mild sedatives. So people use the lettuces to calm themselves down or if they have trouble getting to sleep. Getting to sleep. Here Visiting with Huell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Now this is very interesting. Boy, if there ever was a dichotomy of what's going on, exactly, exactly. it's right here because here we are right downtown, right by the freeway, right in the heart of Los Angeles. In the heart of downtown. In a vacant lot. A vacant lot, right. I'm standing here with Christopher and Dolores. Nierges. Nierges. Right. Yeah. is what? It's Hungarian. My father's Hungarian. Oh, yeah. okay. But yeah. your wife is part Lakota. Indian. Right. Lakota. Uh, yes. And Cherokee. And Cherokee. And what she is, what the two of you all do is very, very interesting because you teach classes at various colleges and universities in Southern California. You give kind of group tours, school tours Correct. around the Los Angeles area. And it's called the School of Self-Reliance. Self and what is that all about, Chris? Well, you know, in essence, we're teaching people what we've forgotten. 
We're teaching people the old skills when people er everywhere lived off of the land. They grew their own food, they made their own things, they made their shoes, their clothes. And look how far we've come from that today. You know, we came here not only because it's in the heart of downtown, but this is close to where the Yangna Indian village was some 500 or more years ago. Uh, we're, we're just south of the freeway. The LA River is right over here. So people would have lived here. It wouldn't have looked like this, obviously. There would have been willow trees, alder trees. The rush hour in the morning would have been a dozen or so guys going over to the river, right, to wash up and to maybe hunt a quail or a deer. Uh, what? Rabbits. <laughs> well, we're not here for rabbits, too. What we're here for, and this is so interesting, is that Christopher is going to take us around downtown Los Angeles and we're going to find things in very unlikely places that can actually feed us, right. that we can actually eat. That's right. We're going to make a salad and I know you're fond of these things so I'm going to let you taste some later in the day. But it shows that nature wants to survive. Right? If we don't pave everything over, we would have food everywhere. Yeah. There, you know, I saw a homeless guy walk by. Maybe he eats out of trash cans. I mean, look at this lot. Nobody eats out of it. The fact is, the food here is far superior to whatever he's eating out of a trash can. So right here, right here, right here there is food. Now, before we go looking for the food, you were doing what? I was doing a little drumming, which sets a coon for the activity that we're going to do here. And I do a little pulse walking. It's a Native American step that you do with the drumbeat. Now, why are we doing that now before we go looking for the food? Well, there's a common attitude toward nature that it's here for us to push around. And that's actually not the attitude that you should take. We have a lot to learn from the Native Americans with regard to the attitude toward nature, being harmonious with nature and being respectful. So we come setting a harmonious beat, not stomping in, you know, we're here to rip you up and take you and eat you and then leave you behind, but re approach respectfully and approach each plant. We even tell the plant, we're going to pick a little of you and thank you. Yeah. And so you said a coon, you may even say a few respectful words like uh, everywhere a lesson, everything real aid, acknowledging that nature is a value not to serve nature, not to dominate nature, but to be in harmony. Boy, and what a strange place to do something like this. I mean, we are right in the middle of an industrial area. The cars are whizzing by here, and this is an ugly, deserted lot, and yet Christopher, there's food here. Right, there's a lot here. You know. This is a way of saying a prayer, what Dolores is doing. My mother used to say, she grew up on the farm, that you don't put your shoes on the table because you eat on the table and food is sacred, right? Because on the farm, you knew what it took to raise food. So if this is food, then we think this is sacred too. Yeah. So why should we be poisoning off our food? Now here's something, you, will, you have to kind of get in here. This one is related to the so-called marshmallow. This is mallow, and you can eat the, Leaves Wait a like so. Just it, just right. And you try you won't might want to might want to try one of these. It tastes like a cheese. They call it cheese wheat or mallow. I would Look suspect at this, Louis. This is just a just a little seed from the cheese weed or mallow. Children chew on it. Um, you could actually make a rice like dish when these are dried and you boil them and you cook them. I can just eat it like you this. You can just eat it and I'm gonna put some in my bag for our salad today, which Boy, I'm you know what? It just dawned on me, I'm accepting what you tell me on faith. <laughs> yeah. I'm out here to bake a lot eating weeds because Christopher tells me it's okay. That's good. I've studied these for over 20 years now, Huel, so you're not going to have any trouble today. Actually, this is very good. It's very tasty, isn't it? Now, would this have been here? I mean, this is I'm a leaving, native plant? leaving a little bit of it tobacco with the roots as a fertilizer. No, in fact, this is not a native plant. That's the funny thing about it. A lot of the foods that the Native Americans ate are no longer here. This is an introduced plant from Europe, but it's here, it's food, so um, we're gonna use it, okay? Wow, that's the first thing we came up on right there. What is this called? This is called mallow. Now, are you are you keeping some of the leaves for our salad I'm later on? I'm putting some of the top leaves and the seeds into our bags for Boy, our salad those later. seeds are good. Yeah, they're tasty, aren't they? This is just the time of the year to do it. Wow. 
Now, if you are in the habit of mowing down your yard because you think it's a fire hazard, you don't have food in your own backyard. Yeah. Now, this is beautiful. Look at this. Now, what is this? Does it look like anything that you know as a common vegetable? Does it uh, look like anything familiar to you? Look at this. What it, oh, this looks like cauliflower. Cauliflower. No, broccoli. broccoli. Look, Louie, you kind of see. I don't know whether you can get in on that or not. No, it's not broccoli. It's a wild relative of broccoli. It's common mustard. This is mustard. <laughs> so this is mustard. Now, this, this mustard. would have been here from the Indian days, wouldn't there, it? There were some mustards, and there were introduced mustards. So they would have had access to some mustard. So what do you eat? The blossoms? Do you eat the leaves? We eat everything that's tender. See how I'm picking off the blossoms? Okay, we're going to put that in our salad. I'm just gently picking up Show the Louis your hands so he can see that. We're okay. just picking off the blossoms. Here. Just picking off. Right. But it seems to me like the leaves might be pretty good too. The leaves are very tasty. In fact, the leaves make a good soup, a good stew, a good broth. Uh, when they get older, feel them, feel how they're kind of furry. Yeah. So if you use a lot of them in salad, it may be a bit irritating, so you have to chop it up and mix it with other greens. That's what I eat. I'm struggling, isn't it? <laughs> I'll just leave all these. Chew on that stem. You're going to like it. You mean bite it off? And yeah, chew it. Eat it. It's a little spice in my pot. Mustard. Very typical mustard type leaf. And this one, uh, people can find all over the world. This has worldwide distribution. Very typical mustard leaf shape. Oh, this is actually good. Very Boy, very this is eye-opening, I'm telling you. Now, what about these white flowers over here? Okay. You'll be surprised about this one. This is actually pretty attractive. Some people try to raise a garden and they don't have a pretty flower bed like this. Yeah. Believe it or not, this is a type of wild lettuce. Really? It's a type of a wild lettuce. It's called Malacothrix. That's the Latin name. It has a bit of a white milky sap. And even though it's a lettuce, you'll find it very bitter. If we put this in my salad or your salad, you would spit it out. It's oh. very bitter. It has to be cooked. So does it have a medicinal purpose or a, or a nutritional purpose? Uh, all of the wild plants are more nutritious than uh, your conventional farm-grown plants, yeah. but the lettuces in general are mild sedatives. So people use the lettuces to calm themselves down or if they have trouble getting to sleep. Here is an actual lettuce, though. This is the parent plant. Where, right here? This plant, believe it or not, is the parent plant of all of our mo modern lettuces, head lettuces and everything. It bears no resemblance to it, does it? Now, are we going to eat any of that? No, because once again, just feel it. When it gets old, it's tough, it's uh, prickly. Yeah. And um, So you got to eat bitter. it when it's very young. The timing it's is coming out of it. Now, wait a minute. What's this? OK, you have a good eye there. It doesn't look like the other mustard, does it? No. OK. Look at the leaf shape compared to the leaf that I Hold that and let me find my other mustard leaf here. We've got two different leaf shapes. Believe it or not, they're both mustard. Uh -huh. This is actually a little tastier. This one is called on my right hedge mustard. It looks like an arrowhead in a way. And I'm going to add this to our salad also. So this is another well, We mustard. need to be picking, picking some of this. Yeah, we'll pick a little bit of this. And keep in mind, when you go through a lot like this on your own, you don't just indiscriminately pick things. You have to know plants one by one well, by one. Sure. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? That people don't know what to pick, what's poisonous, what's going to be bitter, what's... That's, right. that's, 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 wh that's why we teach classes. Yeah. Uh, there are hundreds of books out there, but you have to see stuff in the field. There yeah. are no shortcuts, right? Yeah. There are no shortcuts whatsoever. You've got to get into the field. What? I can tell you the thumb rule. When in doubt, do without. Uh-huh. That's the only thumb rule that's any good. Yeah, well, I would have done without everything in here. I never would have thought to come here. There's a medicinal plant as well. Boy, this looks terrible down here. Now, I never would have stopped to get to this. Actually, I thought this was the uh, hormone. This is the pine nut from um, Nalo. Well, we, don't want, we don't want to eat that one, but here's a good one. We're going to see more of this in a younger stage over in uh, up the road a piece. But this is a lamb porter gone to seed. A what? It's called lamb's quarter. Uh -huh. Now, when you go to the market, there is a seed called quinoa. That's Q-U-I-N-O-A. And quinoa seed is 
one of the most nutritious wild seeds. So much to know. That's interesting. So when he's ground up the seeds in his hands, if you want it by rubbing your hands together, yeah. rubbing it together, it's not quite ripe yet. But if you wanted to make a high protein seed or soup, you would collect some plant water seeds and add it to your super stew. So, yeah. so these homeless guys that might be eating out of trash cans, they've got better food right here in this lot. Well, we all have better food oh, than this here in the lot because this is something we could all eat. This is Are these? Let's walk over here because I'll see something else over okay. here. I'm, I'm looking for all kinds okay, of things let's take now. A little walk down here. Uh, are these all uh, things that the that the Indians would have? Well, wait a minute now. Oh, that's interesting. Oh yeah, here it is. <laughs> You've got a good eye for new stuff. Uh, I'll tell you what. Here's another one right here. Oh wow! Look at one. this. Smell it. Smell it. Yeah. This is something that you can bag up. And, and give to people at the office during Christmas time when they eat a lot of stuff and get indigestion and, and so forth. This is called Epizodi. This is from Central America, and now it's very common here. The how did it get here? Um, it, it's hard to say how it got here. You know how things spread. Yeah. People, seeds get shipped. People come and move them. But it's all over the United States now, and it's... Is it it's, poison oak? No, there's no poison oak here. That's a, okay, a type of... I just over here and saw that. It looked like poison oak. This is nature's uh, beano fuel. Really? Nature's beano. You put it in your refried beans or your bean dishes, and you don't get gas. Wow. Now, we know... You how do you know we, all we of this? We know that you don't need it, but you might have some friends at the office that do. But how do you, how do you know all this? Uh, just from studying. I, took, I mean, the Indians never wrote this down, did they? Well, uh, some of them did. There were uh, historians who studied with some of the Native American people, but the Indian people are still with us. Yeah. You know, and they passed it on generation to generation. And, and the early uh, Spanish and Mexican settlers here would have brought traditions with them as well. Everyone would have brought Now here's, herbs. here's something. Okay. This is that, the, the, uh, the one that's sticky again. Yeah, the lettuce, the lettuce. Yeah. And this one is the sunflower. Yeah. This is a native sunflower. That's what I was looking for right. over here. I spotted this all the way over across the way. Now, can yeah. you eat this? Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can eat on the sunflower except maybe these little buds. Uh -huh. So it's not a rich food source. It's a beautiful plant to have in your yard, though. Well, why couldn't you eat it? Would it make you sick? No, it wouldn't make you sick, but it's mostly like uh, eating corn stalks or something. It's a lot of cellulose. Uh -huh. Feel the leaf. Uh -huh. You could eat it. So oh, boy, that's tough. Right, it's a tough leaf. You could eat that it. gives the word roughage a whole new meaning. <laughs> yeah, if you need roughage. Now, now, check out these grasses. I don't know if these are native grasses or not, but one of the ways that people got their grains in the past was to harvest grass seeds. You know, what? did you have any grass today? Corn, wheat, rice. Yeah. So grasses have, you know, people have eaten grasses for millennia, even the wild grasses like this. Wow. And again, timing is important. Isn't this interesting when you come out here with a new way of looking at things? Oh, yeah. It's almost like we're in a garden now, in a vegetable garden. We, we are in a vegetable garden. What people don't realize is that when you cut your yard down, all of your food you've destroyed. Look at this. Yeah. And now, what is this plant again? Oh, boy. Now you're giving me a test, and giving I can't remember. Now, do you think it's edible or poisonous? I think it's edible, because you're collecting it to put this out. <laughs> this is the lamb's quarter. Yeah. Remember the lamb's quarter seed that I showed you? And this? We haven't seen one of these. Now, that one is called horseweed. It's also, it's edible, but it's not commonly used for food because it's a it's a very rough type plant. Yeah. And that's the one again. So we've pretty well extinguished what's here. That's correct. As far as variety is concerned. That's correct. There's another uh, spot that I'd like to take you to that's at the possible northern end of the Indian village. I'm not going to tell you where it's at yet. Now, what about this dried stuff? Could you eat anything that's dried like this? In this case, the seed is very hard to extract. Uh -huh. What some people do is they put these in a sieve and they, and they burn it to get the shaft off of the seed. But it's very hard to extract the seed. I did see some more lamb's quarter somewhere that is readily harvestable. Um, sometimes even these dead things have seeds. I'm not certain what this one is. It almost looks like the desert, the way it's so hard packed, you know? Boy, this is so amazing. Where's, where's the dead lamb quarter? To think that we are harvesting. There's downtown L.A. right there. 
and this is just a deserted old lot, and we've gotten about half our salad already, don't we? Right. See, we're still a little early for the lambs quarter seed, but this is what you want it to be in your yard. This is what our front yard looks like. We let the lambs quarter grow everywhere. Really? So we get grains for soup, for salad, and we get seeds for the bread. And see, most people, when they would drive around and see something like that in somebody's front yard, would say, why aren't you cutting your weeds down? That's what the neighbors say to us. <laughs> oh, that's what they do say to us. So we tell them that we eat them. <laughs> well, I bet your neighbors think you're strange. So. I hope are, you, are you educating them to this? Um, some of the neighbors who, who know what we do, we have some in our outings. Yeah, yeah. See, our ideal is that in some kind of case, you're required to cut everything down. Yeah. You're not allowed to have a wild front yard. We, we actually have birds and wildlife in our yard because we let everything grow wild. And we're producing oxygen. We're producing food for ourselves. And uh, most of us don't think that way. The average green lawn does nothing. You know, a flat, clean green lawn. Yeah. Nothing. You do yeah. a lot of work and you throw your crap away. Yeah. All right, I almost hate to leave this place because this is such a, uh, this has been such a rich find for us. Where are those seeds I started off eating? Uh, the, <laughs> the mallow, let's see. I want to get one here. more bite Just of those here. before we leave. I'll put a few These more things bag. are great. Yeah. They, I wish I could describe the taste, but people often say cheesy. It's kind of like it's bland, cheesy-like texture. And one wow. of the things you should know about this plant, mallow as in marshmallow. People take the root of a relative of it and boil it, and it becomes like egg whites. And they whip that up, and that was an old medicine. You add the mallow root extract of honey, and, and the original marshmallow was a medicine for a cough or sore throat. It wasn't a candy. See, these are things that we used to, that everybody used to know. Right, right. Automatically. But over the years, we've forgotten all of this. Right. It, it hasn't been handed down. This, this is what's more important to everybody, right? Development. Exactly. The automobile. Exactly. To most people, this, is a, this is a worthless lot, right? Because it's considered a non-productive lot. But there's probably more oxygen and life on this lot than certainly, you know, across the, the freeway there. Yeah. It's a great place. Okay, now we have come just a couple of miles. Christopher, we're in Elysian Park, and you brought us here because this is still part of where the, that original Indian village would have been. According to some historians, Elysian Park is the northern extremity of the Yangna village. And of course, the river would have just been down there a ways. You can't see anything but a cement ditch today. Yeah. But this is a high area. It would have been well protected. So this is this is part of the Yangna Indian village. Now, you brought us here for a couple of reasons, the first one being a negative reason. Right. People have to know about poisonous plants, too. You just don't go willy-nilly eating everything in the wild. This one is an ornamental. Even though the Native American people had plenty of poisonous plants to be concerned about, this one was uh, is, is now in everybody's yard and it's in parks all over the country. It's called, oleander. It's an oleander. This can kill you. It can kill you. It can kill you. It's that deadly. Now, does that mean that if I got one leaf like this and ate it? It's actually that bad that you would get very sick from one leaf. But from one leaf? From one leaf. But, but let me tell you where the deaths usually occur. These long, you don't see it so much here, but see the long stems? Yeah. When the, when the road crews uh, do mulching and they clear the, uh, and prune the, uh, along the roadways, they chip it all and put it on the uh, floor of the parks. And children come and they roast, you know, they look for sticks to roast hot dogs and marshmallows. And if it's six months, you know, old and it's not that dried up yet, the oil will go into their hot dog or marshmallow and they'll get poisoned. Really? Yeah, and deaths have occurred that way. See, this is what I think keeps people from eating weeds. Right, you have to know Is they thing. don't feel secure enough. It's kind of like that mushroom thing. You're right, not right, sure which right. ones are good and which right. ones are going to kill you. So right. it's very important. Don't do this until you do your homework. Right. Right. And okay. you got a couple of books. We've got a couple of books which for are, people to do their homework. Give you the right. homework. <laughs> and here's something that you said was good to eat. Right. Now this is actually a native to the entire west coast. They say it's native to South America, 
but when you go along the beaches, you find this everywhere now. And what is it? Oh boy. It's nasturtium. 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 Every tender portion can be eaten. And if you go to these uh, specialty health food stores, you'll oh, see Oh, those are the edible flowers. Edible flowers. But they edible. put them on top of salad. Right here, let's um, give you a little leaf to taste. And you could, we actually take these little pods. I and can eat this? You can eat that. Now, wait a minute. You know, driving over here in the car from our first location, right. I was thinking of all the things that I'd eaten over there. Right, okay. And we didn't wash any of it off. Well, that's a good point. Now, how do we, we know were, what was on those leaves? We were fortunate yesterday we had a good rain. Oh. I kept that in mind. But generally, I would wash stuff. Remember that rain we had yesterday morning? Yeah. It was kind of freak for this time of the year. But so I feel confident that you don't have to worry about smog and things like that. You really have a lot more to fear. Oh, that's good. Now I want you to taste this. A little seed pot of the mystery. Oh, this has a whole, it's that has kind of a uh, spicy it's taste. It's spicy, yeah. Just chew it a you little bit. You didn't tell me that. <laughs> well, it is good, though. It's very tasty. It's good in salads. And uh, if you... Oh, boy! That's uh, hot, isn't it? So you just have the nasturtium. <laughs> right? A surprise. Right. Yeah, the first time I had it. But this is not a bad it. surprise. Yeah, Let me have it, another one there. It's actually kind of salad. a little. Uh, we call them wild capers. Now it looks like a human brain, doesn't it? Wow. Put some Look of these this, flowers Louis, in. And it's real hot. It tastes. What, how would you describe kind of what it? Horseradish, right? Yeah. Dolores pickles these and just in, in fresh vinegar. We we'll eat them about two weeks to a month later, you know, as a garnish, and it's it's quite tasty, right? Boy. They, you know, you ought to you ought to interest uh, the folks at Philippe about that. They have you can serve that with your bread. It's hot, isn't it? I'm sorry. Oh boy, that is hot. Sorry about that. Well, we are ending up our adventure here at one of my favorite places in all of Los Angeles here in Elysian Park. What a view of the new Los Angeles. Yeah, it's beautiful up here. Beautiful and up here. here's this wonderful sculpture that's been up here for a couple of years which is just one of my favorite places to come and sit and we've kind of got the whole display out here this is what we've been doing all day that's right this is our our salad Dolores just put some uh, alyssum flowers there and this is some dressing I'll put on now wait a minute let's look at this okay. first okay. these are all the things that we picked during the day. This is the kind of salad everybody should be eating every day. You never need to buy lettuce anymore. Wow. You know, can I test you? What is uh, this? Oh, no, I okay. can't remember all this. <laughs> okay, we've got lamb's quarter and mustard and mallow and alyssum and nasturtium and down there, little cactus and some fennel stems. Wow. Prickly pear cactus. Okay, now we're going to put a little bit of salad dressing. A little bit of dressing on it. Just kind of give it a light dressing. And then what do we do? We're going to Then I'm going to put it in your dish. You get to eat out of a... Um, where's your dish today? An abalone shell. Mm -hmm. Scoop you out a little bit. And you get to use chopsticks made from local sticks. Now, would the Indians have eaten with, with sticks like this? Um, I actually, I really don't know, but they would have eaten out of uh, wood and burned out bowls like this. Yeah. Shells like you're eating out of... Oh, give him... Acorn pancake. Made it fresh this morning. This goes good with our breakfast. I want you to, you to try some of that beverage. Oh this, boy, this acorn is good. Glad you like it. That is cactus fruit juice. It's fresh from the cactus fruit. It's delicious. Wait a minute, let me eat. I've never, uh, this is kind of throwing me off eating with chopsticks. Indian chopsticks. No, they're lamb's quarter chopsticks, actually. That's lamb's quarter wood. Lamb's quarter wood, yeah. Now, we often, we often don't take eating implements into the wild. Mm. Why? Because the wild, the, the woods are full of chopsticks. Right? Right, don't use oleander for your chopsticks. This is as good a salad as I've ever had. It's probably the best. It's certainly the most nutritious. Wow! Isn't that good? Did you get some of that cactus in there? Yeah, I want to get a little bit of this this cactus juice. Isn't that tasty? I don't know. I hadn't tried I haven't it. Haven't tried it. Right. It's the fruit from the prickly pear. Right. That's this. Now Louis was talking about how he likes to eat cactus. 
Well, this, um, this cactus produces a fruit, either red or orange like this, and it's in juice. And it's a, it's a pretty good juice, isn't it? It's very good, and I'll tell you what, it, it, for historical purposes, it's probably better than going down to get a, a drink of water out of the Los Angeles River today, don't you think? <laughs> and we can't do that today. No. Yeah. We're cleaning up the L.A. Right. River, but it's not quite drinkable yet. Not quite yet. drinkable, no. Now, while we're eating this, and this is really, boy, this acorn is good, too. Let's talk for just a minute about what we've learned today, okay. because okay. I've been thinking about this. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people watching today are never going to eat any of these plants. Right, that's entirely possible. But what you saw is that in the, in the waste lands, the places that people think of as, you know, nothing, there's lots of food and medicine. Okay, we went into the park, and it was where people did not mow where we found food and medicine. So what people can gain who are never going to take advantage of this is at least an increased awareness right. that these plants exist, exactly. that they're all around us, exactly. that they have positive uses, exactly. and really point out how far we have strayed right. We've gone from so our far. original touch exactly. of nature. Remember when we went to that lot this morning? Most people driving by see that as a vacant, dirty lot, right? But we found food there, we found medicine there. There was actually a willow tree on to the edge where people would have made tools and used medicine. There was an oak tree adjacent where you would have gotten acorns. This is what this, uh, that little, little pancake yeah. came from. It came from acorns like this. And for those of you who want to start eating this stuff, there are books they can, they can buy, there are mm -hmm. classes they can sign mm -hmm. up for. Right. And then for those of you who are kind of halfway in between, you could locate a couple of plants that you're sure of, right. that you know aren't poisonous, that you know are growing in, on your property, right. and kind of integrate those into exactly. your regular diet. You can kind of go halfway on them. Right. Because you're not going to, even you, you're not going to remember all of these. No. After, if you remember and one. And I'd be right? afraid. Right. To, unless I knew for sure. Exactly. And that's, that's good. But if you remember one perfectly, then you can always include that in your diet. What, did, what was that slogan you said, Dolores? Yes, in doubt. Without. There's the new Los Angeles over there. Here's the old Los, old Angeles, Los Angeles right here right, right. that is still all around us. That's right, it's still here. If we just look for it. Right. Just look for it and don't keep cutting it down. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you very, very much. This has been great. I'm not Thank sure you. I knew exactly what we were in for. Here's to the old ways, okay? To the old way. To the old way. To the old way. There you go. It's been a wonderful day. This is a great salad. There's a common attitude toward nature that it's here for us to push around, and that's actually not the attitude that you should take. We have a lot to learn from the Native Americans with regard to the attitude toward nature, being harmonious with nature, and being respectful. Visiting with Jewel House made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Visiting with Jewel Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Well, hello everybody, I'm Huel Hauser, and this is going to be an honest-to-goodness learning experience for all of us, because we're going to do something today that I think is going to surprise all of us. We're going to learn a lot today, so get ready. Now, here we are in beautiful Chino, and when you think of Chino, you think of cows. Look out there, right across the field there, there must be thousands of cows over there. There, there are hundreds of thousands of cows, of course in Chino. Chino is the cow capital, not only of California, but of the world. But, of course, we're PBS, so we do things a little bit different. We try to take things to a new level, so we have come to Chino not to see cows. We're here to take a look at, well, there they are. Look at these things. This is a water buffalo. A water
water buffalo, and this has to be the only herd of water buffalo in Chino, doesn't it? That we're aware of. <laughs> okay, let's introduce ourselves. Your name is? Hi, Layla. Layla Ciccone and? I am a Virgil Ciccone. Virgil Ch Ciccone. Ciccone. C-I-C-C-O-N-I. A good Italian name. No, we are Finn. Finn! Oh, you're Italian. See? <laughs> We're going to have trouble with him right now. Now, we, we are here to do a story about mozzarella cheese. You all make mozzarella cheese, correct? Yes, sir. And the connection between water buffalo and mozzarella cheese, what's the connection? The important is starting from the foundation. It means the meat, the milk. Milk is what the demand then the product you gotta do. If you, you see in Italy for a century the mozzarella was only the one made with the water buffalo. The other was called Fior di Latte, means the flour of the milk. And then in 1963 or 64 was a big fight between the two groups. Finally the people who made the mozzarella with the cow had the right to call also their product mozzarella, but mozzarella made with the cow milk, and that's what is over there. All here we call mozzarella everything that milk. Even the stuff that goes on the pizza is called mozzarella. mozzarella. But real mozzarella has to be made with water buffalo milk. Yes. Now, let's talk about these beautiful creatures. Look at them over here, Louis. Can I go up and can you touch them? Oh, yeah. They're tame? They've all got different personalities, just like people do. Uh -huh. So some are a lot friendlier than others, and some are meaner than others. That's the, the ring in the nose. The ring in the nose means it's a mean one? It could be, yes. When, uh, when they were baby, to control the animal, they put this ring. So if you want to ah. sport to the animal, you got to attach the rope or something, and then they're going to follow you. Now, where did these water buffalo come from? This, uh, uh, the, the federal, uh, uh, in 1983, had this program of uh, 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 importing this country water buffalo for uh, meat and milk. From? From, uh, so uh, they researched in India, uh, Argentina, Brazil and Europe, and they choose to uh, to introduce the animal from uh, Trinidad Island in Venezuela, where they were. These are the most, uh, 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 but uh, I want to say, uh, free from many many uh, sickness or whatever it is. This is a race which is the strongest in the world in few words. So these are from Venezuela, right? Right. And you have how many of them here? Altogether, we have a 90, 97. 97 water buffalo. And have they caused kind of a scene here in Chino? Well, from what we know, practically every car that drives by stops them. To take a look at these things. Well, look at this. Look at this. Come in here, Louie. Let's get a real tight shot of this. There, now, there's a face you're not used to seeing in Chino. All the way from Venezuela. Look, they do look like this. They look. Yeah. That's uh, our bull. Where is the bull? This one. Oh. Blondie? No, no. This is Elmo. What's his name? Elmo. 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 And this is his harem out here? Yes. These are all his? Yes. So he rules this pen right Absolutely. here? Absolutely. They take it up to 35 cows. Really? Yes. He has 35 wives here. Well, they can do that up to 35 cows. Then you got to split the, you got to split the herd because you cannot have a two bulls in one day. So you got one bull here and one is here. And on the other end down here, we got another bull with with his 30 wives. Oh, this, uh, yeah, this more. Well, we've learned a lot about water buffalo, but we're really not here to do a story about water buffalo. We're here to do a story about the milk from water buffalo that's turned into mozzarella cheese. So we are going to leave 
Elmo and his 35 wives. I don't think he'd mind. <laughs> and uh, head off to where are we going? We're going to Gardena. Gardena, which is where you have your mozzarella cheese plan. And we're going to watch the production of Honest to Goodness. This is the real stuff. This is the way it's always been made. We hope so. We're in big trouble. Traditionally, though, this is the way it's been made for hundreds of years in Italy. You're going to love it. Okay, we're off. Goodbye, Elmo. Hey, girls. And the girls, look at them. They're all posing for us. Oh, you don't know, but they, they don't like the camera. What do you mean? Oh, they know the camera. If you go and take a, a photograph to them, they don't like the flash. Really? Oh, yeah. Here she comes. Now, can I feed her? She doesn't like it. Likes to lick. Oh, look at this. I've never been licked by a Oh, boy. <laughs> now there's a first. I never in a million years thought I'd be licked by a water buffalo. And let me think. Oh, boy. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, that's an experience I'm not going to forget for a long time. Now what do I do with my hands? Well, we can go wash them. <laughs> God. Boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. And I see Elmo's over there. He's getting jealous because one of his girlfriends was licking my hand. So I think he's 50-50 right now. He's impressed with his food and I don't think he's too worried. <laughs> there she goes. Oh, so you really can. Yeah, look at this. They're friendly. Just got to work up to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she wants to lick me again. Oh, gosh. Oh, look at that tongue. <laughs> yeah, didn't feel you. They kind of have to grow on you, don't they? They're worth it. At first. In no. India, there is uh, in, uh, uh, the mother said to the son, "If I gonna die, you gonna survive. But if the cow, if the water buffalo dies, you gonna die. Because uh, for some family, that was their the cow which feed the family. Just like in the tea office, we go, you know, we go to the we go, we go to provide for fresh meat and cheese." So this is, uh, and uh, in India, in, in, in the uh, Pakistan, in that area, or uh, uh, Vietnam, they are using this as a tractor. As a tractor? Yeah. How expensive it is? Are they expensive? Well, I told you, five, six thousand. Five or six thousand dollars a piece? Yes, but I bought uh, some, uh, you know, in, in bulk, uh, ten, six, eight. 15, uh, 17 at the time, so I paid up uh, down to $4,000. $4,000 a piece? They're worth it. This is investment of here. We got to here all together, we got uh, uh, almost $350,000 in, uh, in cash. All right, we're off to Gardena. We've spent half the show talking about water buffalo, but they're fascinating animals. They are very majestic and very interesting, and the milk is better than cow milk? Oh, very pure. A lot creamier, and we'll find out. Okay. The difference is this. The regular cow give uh, maybe every eight, nine gallons a day, but the milk go from 3.5, 3.4 of a This animal is two gallons, one and a half gallons, some three gallons. But we need to go to 9.4. It's like a pain. But is it easy to digest? These animals are it's just like a naked. The, the product of this animal, as the most uh, wholesome, is, is uh, the easy to digest, the most you know, uh, flavor. And uh, what I want to say is this even the meat of this animal costs more. Yeah, that's because it's really deep.
We have got to get to Gardena and start looking at the cheese. Okay, we're off. Well, now we have driven all the way from Chino to Gardena, which took about an hour, a little less than an hour. And we have gone to the restroom to wash our hands because I've been licked by that water buffalo. I wanted to get that off my hand. And now we're moving into the very exciting part of cheese production, right? Yes. And we don't have any time to waste. Howdy. How are you doing? Joel Hauser. Your name is? Marco Ciccone. You're the son. Yeah. And this is your sister. So this is literally a family operation. Total family operation. And as we pulled up, you came out to greet us and said we had to hurry up because we didn't have any time to lose. Why is that? Because the cheese is fermenting, and when the cheese ferments, you can't stop it quickly. So we have to stop it a little bit ahead of time, which we're going to be doing right now. And then we can gradually let it finish uh, over the next 10 minutes. And that's why we have to do it right now. Okay, let's do it. This is it. Look at this, Louie. Now, this is actually the... Yeah, that's, there's a lot of... What are we watching right now? Right now, we're going to drain the cur drain the curd and put it on this table so that we can uh, start to cut it. Okay, so this is the curd from the milk itself. Yes. And how long has it been? Uh, for about three hours. For three hours. Yes. Oh boy, there it goes. so critical time-wise to get it out of there just at the, at the right time. Because if we take it out too soon, then we will stop the fermentation before the cheese uh, can get ready. And if we take it out too late, we won't be able to stop the fermentation in time. And if you let it ferment too long, the cheese won't stretch. Ah, very critical. This can I put my hand on there? I just washed it. Yes, you can. I guarantee you I just washed it to get that water buffalo off of me. You see right now it's kind of in pieces. Yeah. In 10 minutes, this is going to be one big piece, and we're going to cut it and stack it on top of each other, and it's going to come back together again. And uh, we'll do that probably two times, and then you'll see that the cheese will be like one solid block. Ah. And that's the fermentation putting everything together, and that's what helps it to stretch. Okay. Now, what are you doing? Taking a piece of cheese from the middle of the curd, where it's the most fermented, and I'm going to put it in here, and I'm going to break it in little pieces. Why are we doing this? This is so I can try and see how far along the fermentation is. Why do you need to know that? Because I need to know if it's too far or if it's far enough, if we're ready to stretch the cheese or not. Stretch the cheese? To stretch the cheese with the hot water. We'll see here in a moment. Boy, this is all... Hot water, look at this, Louie. And you got some cheese in there. And then what? Boy, this is very technical, isn't it? By the way, this water is about 180 degrees, so uh, you don't want to be playing with it too much. Now, is this the way they've always done it, or is this a new advanced... Oh, look. Oh, look. You see how it's, it's, it's stretching, stretching, but it's, it kind of falls apart? Yeah. That means it's not quite ready yet. We're close, but Stretch we're... Stretch it one more time for us. Boy, that is something. 
So now, estimating how long you think it may be? Probably another 10 or 15 minutes. Before it's ready to... Yes, because when it's ready, it'll stretch farther, and it won't break apart so as So you're easy. just going to keep stretching. Right, and in a few minutes, I'm going to cut this, and then in another 10 minutes, I'm going to try this again and see how it looks. Okay, we got a minute here in production, and we wanted to come over and take a look at the milk itself. See, this is raw, unpasteurized, unhomogenized milk, so you can see the, the, the cream there. This is all the butter fat which has risen to the top. Yeah, because your dad was telling us that it's got like 9% butter fat. Right, you can see it right there. Look at this. This is right out of the water bubble. That is almost, it looks like cream, it's so thick. Right. Now, what would that taste like right now? It would taste the way a water buffalo smells. Oh. <laughs> it would taste the way a water buffalo smells. Uh, it's a gamey taste. <laughs> what do they have again? That doesn't smell like a water buffalo. Well, what if I just put a little... That's just like eating pure cream. That is pure, pure cream right there. The first, but this is the first time I've ever had water buffalo cream like this. You're, you're one of the very few. Yeah. At least in this country. Now you start to taste like this in a little bit. You can, you can taste it now? Yeah, oh yeah. This is cheesy. It's far enough along? You bet. Okay. Because otherwise, we are out of business. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now what's happening? See, now this is, gonna, this is all coming back together again. Those pieces that I just put on here, already they're starting to knit together with the other pieces. Look how this is gelling together. This is amazing. You've already taken it, you're consolidating it in there, aren't right, you? Right, we're, we're, what we're doing actually is, because the cheese doesn't all ferment at the same rate, we have to... Uh, when we put it down here on the table, we have to take all the pieces and put them together and get them all the exact same pH. I'm going to have one more little piece of that. Go right ahead. This is good enough to just eat right here, right out of the pan. Well, this actually is a different type of, of cheese. When you, if you don't stretch the cheese, it's considered a, another type of cheese. But, What's uh, this considered? Well, this is what they, in Italy, they call tuma. Tuma. Which is just curd. <laughs> Sir? This is pasta filata. Pasta filata means, you see, after this, the first step, then we gotta cook with hot water and make the final, the final product. This product can last one month, soft, delicious, the way it is. Okay, we're back over to the cheese now, and you're cutting it like crazy. Yeah, this type of work here, you have to do timely manner, otherwise you can lose very easily the whole batch. this whole batch. Okay, so you've cut it and now you're stacking it. You see how now it's holding Look together? Look at this. Yeah. You know, we take the piece and turn it upside down because, if, I don't know if your hands are still clean, but if you feel underneath yeah. is warmer than on top. So we want to take this, which probably hasn't fermented as far, and put it in the middle where it's warmer and it'll catch up. Okay, we're testing it now. We're going to see if it... See, another way, thing I do is I... And this is really hot on my hands, so you I got to be... kind of need it a little bit, So you can you? see how it makes it really fine and smooth, oh, look like at a pearl. That. Look at this. Boy. And now you're pulling it. See, now this has already cooled off a little bit too much to really stretch, but it looks to me like this is about ready. So it's stretching now without breaking. Yes, if this was hotter, it would it would stretch just like like bubble gum. Really? Yeah. Well, that's stretching pretty good right mm -hmm. there. Oh boy! Now here it comes. Look at these balls; they're just popping right out. Can I pick one of these up, Marco? Sure. To use one of those, it's a little bit colder because it, it'll hold its shape. So what are these? These are the these are the balls of mozzarella. Let's see. Look at this, Louis. That's the finished product right yes. there. Yes, yes. 
I almost go crazy to reach this moment, but I am happy. <laughs> and you're the one, we're, we're putting it in. This is the end product. You're just feeding this stuff in these, in this. Uh -huh. You just feed it right in the, the machine here, and it gets mixed up, kind of blended. It gets cut into little pieces, and then these mixing arms, they mix it together. So it's like, uh, let me see if I can grab a piece. Be careful. See, it's all mixed up there. It's uh, going to be like taffy. And then it just and pops then it, out here at the bottom. Yeah, then it flows down here, and that's where it comes out. Look at these things dropping out. <laughs> it's still warm when it comes out. It's very hot. <laughs> it's very hot. So you put it in this cold water, and it just kind of congeals as your dad is pulling it down to the end of the... I'm sorry, I'm... he's too busy working on this thing. He doesn't have time to talk, does he? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's critical. It's, it's critical right to the very end. Exactly. We've got this whole batch waiting for us. And See, look, you've still got to do all of this, and it's got to, it's got to come out. Yeah, we'll be here now, for a while. Now he's putting them in another. Yeah, see, these are very hot right now, and we have to cool them down and keep moving them. Otherwise, they'll, they'll get flattened out. They're so hot, they're still almost melting. So you got to keep them, you got to keep them moving all yeah. the time. Otherwise, they'll settle and they'll get flat. And then they go from here into a colder vat of water over there. Boy, this is interesting. Well, I'm with the whole Chacon family now, including your mom, who is the bookkeeper. You were in here totaling up the book seats and everything today. Yes, I was. And telling us about the way that you should eat. Um, a little bit. Which was? How to make it, how to prepare the caprese. 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 Caprese, which is basically what? Oh boy, look at that. You've made this before, haven't you? Oh yeah, I grew with it. <laughs> <laughs> and you were saying when you came in here, this gets you hungry just looking at it. Yes, it does. We've been working since about six this morning and uh, after a while you get hungry. Okay, here is the finished ball of mozzarella right here that we just saw being made. And your dad has just sliced it on the tomatoes. And how do we eat this? You're so supposed to do the dish with a uh, um, fork and knife. Mm -hmm. You're gonna eat it. And this is called caprese. Caprese. And let's show now what we've got. Here is the smoked mozzarella. Uh, this is more, it's called the scamo. And here is the that we just saw being made. It's called. Boobalus boobalus, which means? Uh, my water buffalo, more than one. <laughs> more than As one water. As you can see, we've got several. Yeah, you've got water buffalo all over the place. Mm -hmm. But we're going to put the number here on the screen so that people can call and find out where they can get yes. this boobalus boobalus. And uh, it's been an absolutely wonderful experience today. Thank you so much. Until today, I had never even seen a water buffalo. Or been licked by one. Or been licked by one. <laughs> you missed that. You missed well, me getting licked. Have you ever been licked by a water buffalo? Many times, many places. Oh, I thought it was a big deal. Have you ever been licked by a water buffalo? I don't get that close to them. No. <laughs> well, this is a family business doing it the quality way with the milk from the water buffalo, which is totally different than the cheese that comes from cows. It's about as good as you can get. Look at it right here on the plate, Louie. This is absolutely wonderful. That is the real thing right there. And it's all being made right here in Southern California. I mean, honestly, we, there is a many things that she makes. We, I don't have much better. You're the best. Right here in Gardena. Makes perfect sense. 
in California, they say it's the cheese, and, and as far as this family is concerned, it's the buffalo, right? Boobalus, boobalus. downtown Los Angeles. I love to come downtown because there's so much history here, so much interesting architecture, like the grand old city hall built back in 1928 and recently restored to its former grandeur. There's a lot of old history, old architecture down here. And then there are buildings like this. And this is where we're going to be spending the afternoon. It's new. It's modern. It's controversial, and I think it's beautiful in its own way, and that's where we're going to be spending the afternoon, kind of nosing around this building. Here's the architect right here. Tom, How are when we you? got here, we're going to be spending the afternoon with you, but when we got here, you were all upset standing out here. You said, what's happened to my building? Well, this isn't it, my building. I thought it might be the wrong day. They've covered it all up. They're making another film. This is L.A., you know, right? So you're making a film down here. Your That's name right. is? Bruce Smith. And tell us what you're yeah. doing. Because, well, first off, Tom, you were upset about the tree. I'm not upset about it. I was completely startled. Do you realize this is not a tree? Those are plastic leaves. This isn't a tree. No, no. We put them in here just to make it a little more unique for the, sh the show. You know? so, so you've re-landscaped exactly. Tom's building. Well. And you've built. What, what is this over here? Well, it's just a, another section. So it, we have another stage down in Sony Studios that has an entrance. And we're trying to tie this into the entrance there so the uh, actor can walk in here. And it looks like you're going up to the. Uh, so this isn't this section right here. It's all fake. It's all fake. Right. This isn't really <laughs> concrete. Wood with a thin concrete over it, so yeah, and then a wash stage. And, and in one afternoon, built all of this. Pretty much. You're they build it in a warehouse. Tomorrow. What's the name of the movie? Fun with Dick and Jane. So all the stars will be here, all the cameras will be here. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know where they're going to be, but they'll be around here somewhere. <laughs> well, they got to be yeah, close yeah. to what <laughs> you just built. And then when you get through filming, you're going to take it all away. That's right. And the building will look like just it's Just exactly like it did. To look. Yeah. So, Tom, this is open. That's all what? brand new. We did that yesterday. This building yeah. over here. Yeah, all that. So the that whole parking lot. Concrete, that, so that's not really concrete block either. No, same thing. Boy, leave it to Hollywood. So it's going to be a couple of days before you get your building back. Yes. But it's coming back. It is. But you know, any good building should withstand a certain amount of abuse and still be a good building. That should be the test, don't you think? Well, it's also <laughs> interesting that it's already being put in the movies. Yeah, you I think know? this is actually, I think this is the second or third film. Really, they've been doing yeah. a lot of filming down Weekly. Down. Weekly here. Really? <laughs> yes, we have a competition of which production company get here first. Really? Yeah, and they're trying from the exterior, now trying to get on the inside. Any part that will allow them access, they'll, they'll come in and use it. Well, let's take a look at the building. First, we haven't met you. Your name is? Jim Hammer. And you're with? Caltrans. Caltrans. I'm the manager here at Caltrans. Caltrans building. Yes, it is. So you've been in here since? Since September. We yeah. moved, started our move in September. We've been here ever since. And we moved about 1,400 employees into this site so far. It's an absolutely spectacular building. And Tom, let's, let's just all kind of go on the walk here. I'm not sure where to start, because what we're going to do is get the, uh, an analysis of the building from the Caltrans standpoint and from the architect's standpoint. And so many times, architects are really un, 
recognized and unappreciated. That's why we wanted to <laughs> hook up with you today. Uh, start off by telling us what the what the idea was behind the way the building is the structure, the way it looks. Well, it looks like it looks because it behaves a certain way. I think a lot of people, uh, I don't know if you've thought about it, but they, they look at a building and they see it as just a visual thing, and it's actually a, a result of some idea, or it, um, it performs. Like you would look at an automobile, and it behaves a certain way, and so the car looks differently based if it goes fast or if, it's, if it carries big things, etc. right? And um, this building probably looks different because it doesn't have any, um, well, it moves. You're looking at the uh, the skin, which is open, which allows people to see through the glass normally, yeah, like the a shade. Yeah, windows kind of open And outward. then they close. They're all in hydraulics, so the whole building at one point is just a skin of punched metal of this, right? This, this, this aluminum skin. Now, and so that's the, unusual because people are used to seeing windows in a conventional building, right? Are all the windows that can open, are they all open now? They or? are. They are. So everybody that has view, everything with view, you're looking at that's open. And, and who when this, opens them? Is there a, a it's, button? It's all, it's all done computer. It's, it's automatic. It's all automated system within our control center. It's when automatic it's, based upon the movement of the center of the day. On, on the other side, the east side of the building, those are, are have been closed and these are open because the sun hasn't moved over here yet. So this effect is, is one side's open, one side's closed. It's all automated about 15 to 20 minutes. It takes for this whole wall to open up. And they're just panels that expose, close the light, open view to the outside. Even though the window is technically not open, you're looking at a, a, a skin, as Thomas said, over the window face. If we're here long enough, it'd be very, very quickly, the sun is gonna to start touching the skin. It's just coming around. And in another uh, 15, 20 minutes, as it comes around, everything closes down. Now, with what that, it is, it's a window shade that's on the outside of the inside. So it radiates the heat for outside. environmental reasons to help the heating yes. and cooling of the about building? It's a 20% boost on energy. Really? Which today, of course, is extremely it, it is quite effective. But now, that's got to be one of the things that people comment on the most when they come, isn't it? It brings life to the building. They're wondering what's the purpose, functionality. And it serves one thing as a viewing. On the outside, you see this movement. You see the different aesthetic effect of it. And on the inside, it provides an open access to the view from the outside. When, when the sun's down or not on the side, when, when they close, it provides some screening from the sun when it's on the, this side of the wall. Now this, in here, kind of now you're beginning to really get the idea of the way these things just kind of pop out. They just a pneumatic system that opens them up, like I said earlier, about a 15, 20 minute cycle to open up this entire wall. You can see the light coming right around here, right? It's got yeah. another about five degrees and everything closes down. That is a very silent thing, too. You don't even know it unless you're looking out the window. All of a sudden, this thing starts lowering. Now, what is this sticking out here? That's something else I noticed uh, just driving down First Street. Is this thing just comes out? This, it's a, this, it's a light bar. It's 250 feet long, and it's a, um, it's conceptual. It's 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 both represents uh, movement and it represents the uh, kind of the idea of Caltrans. They make freeways. They're interested in infrastructure, and it's about that. And at night, you see this piece of light that just streaks through. You know when you take a photograph at night and you see the lines of red, yeah, the cars move. It was a notion of catching that the notion of the automobile in movement, because that's what this place is. And at night, you're going to see this big line. And the line is at the same level as Disney on First Street. Wow. And the line is going to point right to Disney and Dorothy Chandler. And it's literally a connecting link of the city. And represents some, um, and I have a, an idea of a building that's connecting things. It's part of an urban structure. It's not just a thing of its own. It's about connecting the city. Wow. Did he, did he sell you on all this? Were you with him every step of the way? I, I unfortunately was not, but I got in towards the end of this as we were completing construction before I move in, and it's been a great partnership. I was going to say, I'm beginning to get the feeling you share his yeah. original passion for this. Because, you know, architects are very passionate people. As a, being responsible for the building use now and to maintain and operate, I feel very fortunate that I got a building like such as this from Tom here. Now we're here in the afternoon, so it's not all these lights are not on. I think we're going to come back tonight and get some pictures of it to use at this point in our program. But this is this building is also a light show, isn't it? Exactly. This is a uh, a public room. 
This is a room for the city, and it can be used for any kind of events that anybody wants to use this for. This room is right part here. outside and part inside. And what you're looking at is a piece um, that was a collaboration with Keith oh, Sonier yeah. out of New York. And it's, this whole piece is going to light up. You're looking at just a little bit of the light on now. It's going to change continuously on a program, and it's, it's moving, like, again, the dynamicism of the place and the automobile. It's continually changing. And when it's completely on behind us, this whole piece lights up. It is, it's got a, a blue light and a red light, and they're constantly moving and changing from a very dense pattern to a sparse pattern, etc. Wow, this is so interesting. Looking up now at the at the building, you can see the shades just kind of popped out there, and in just uh, less than an hour, the side of the building that we're looking at now will be completely flat after those shades have closed. That's right. Actually, when you see them close, it's quite wonderful. The whole thing just starts moving at once. It's a close. It's kind of unusual. You don't think about it on a hatchback of a car. Or we live in a world that everything is kind of operational. Yeah. We, you don't expect it on a building as much, I don't think, do you? you? Well, you certainly don't expect the whole building, the whole side of the building, to kind of move like that at one right. time. And of course, we're interested in the transformation. It looks like one way when you see it at one time, you come back and it looks like something else. So, right? depending upon where you're standing in downtown LA and what time of day or night it is, yes. this building looks different. It's it always does. changing. It is always changing, whether you're on the northeast corner or the south. You can go two blocks away of the south of here and it has a whole nother effect that this building offers, whether the panels are open or not. The scan in a way, it would seem like it's a piece of clothing. You can change, right? We can keep changing this and it's part of the culture of the, of the human character. And the building's the same. You'll see it's uh, like our clothing. We, we demonstrated that as it wrinkles. You've noticed. You didn't ask that, but you were about to ask that. Those are it like wrinkles. Down and then it Look stops, at this. And it kind of wrinkles a bit like a fabric, and then it kind of moves out and kind of actually makes the space of the plaza. It kind of wrinkles down and comes around. And it's oh, so wait a skin. minute. This is part of same the wrinkle right, right here. here. Look at it coming down right here. It's coming down and it wrinkles and bends again and then bends out. And it's this whole fabric now. It's this very it rolls soft right ephemeral, out rolls out, and now you're underneath it, right? You're, you actually occupy the space between the body and the skin. And then it goes out. And it makes this space, which is the plaza, which is the entry, which, of course, as you mentioned earlier, is the, here it is, making reference to City Hall. The whole idea of the plaza, making reference to the, to the center of the city. You notice the 100 sign, first in Maine, 100 first, 100 Maine kind of the epicenter of the city, the beginning of the, of the original city, so we use the sign as a, it's Hollywood, it's, 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 it's uh, I mean, signage in LA are singular, it's part of the city, right? Now we've moved around for another perspective on the building, this side of the building doesn't have any skin on it. No, this one's facing north, and it's the one that's clear that you can, it reveals the functions of the building. So, is there a front side or a side or a back to this building? How do you... How do you determine where the front of the building is? Interesting question. Um, it, it doesn't really have a front. It, it, every, every edge is its own front, although it clearly has a front in terms of entry, which is the plaza we went through. It faces City Hall, right? And then that sequence of spaces that gets us into the, into the building. And now you begin to really see this, this band that, that comes out from the building. Yeah, it's interesting to talk to you. You're really interested in uh, kind of ideas and buildings. It no, makes I, it really fun to talk. But you know what? I've been fascinated by this building from the beginning because it's so unique and so different and makes such a statement. I've been interested and amused that it's been so controversial. What's interesting is because this piece seems to be the one that's been one of the ones that's been most interested, I think, by the public in that it, 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 you, you move under it. It moves out over the sidewalk and it moves over the edge of the building and you actually are participating. You're in the building in a way without, just as you walk through the city, it becomes a gateway or a threshold. And um, somehow it violates just the rules that people, buildings are here and streets are here and it moves out over that and everybody kind of looks at it as kind of flabbergasted. Now we've come around to the, is it, this is the south side. Of it. Yes, it is, south side. And this has a total, totally different look to it. It does. We're, this is where we're covered with the photovoltaic cells, covering the entire south wall. Wait a minute, Bill. This whole wall here, 
where the windows are is covered by, by uh, this is all solar power. These are photovoltaic panels, which are both shading the glass and producing energy at the same time. Wow. So the pieces that are on an angle, you can see it, yeah? All the pieces that are sitting on an angle are the photovoltaic panels. So are you producing electricity for your own building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cover the costs and the, and the power needs for the building. This is a very economical building that was done in a very short period of time, believe it or not. And um, did fact, I read that it was on time and on budget? You did. <laughs> yes. And I'll testify to that. All right, that's why you're so happy. Yes, I am. But to answer your question, yes, everything that's part of a building has to be used aesthetically, has to be used as part of the expression of the building. It's a gray building. Well, it's a Caltrans building. We were actually very interested in their role of building the freeway, which is the infrastructure of Los Angeles, which makes LA, LA. And we wanted to use concrete. We wanted to use the steel that comes out of the siding and the bridges. We wanted to have the toughness and the clarity and the simplicity of the freeway system. This really gives you a sense of the, of the way this comes out, too, to a peak, and, and this skin, the way it the right. skin just comes off the side of the building and, and it comes out. And now it becomes another skin for the street. And then out of that, these three-dimensional letters that are both 2D and 3D, they're kind of ripped out of the skin and you see the other half of them. What is and that, the address of the building? It is, in fact, it was really funny. At some point they were asking us if we hadn't had an address sign. And I went, oh dear, um, have you looked up? <laughs> You've got the biggest address sign in downtown LA. I think so, you just have to know where to look. You know, you're right in the middle of it here. Here's, here's old St. Viviana's over here. The old cathedral that's being restored and given a new life. You've got your big building here, and here's the Hollywood crew here sitting on a. I guess they're taking a lunch break from the movie they're going to be filming that they built the set into the side of your building. There's construction going on all around us, buses and noise and sounds and people. You're right in the middle of it. This is LA for sure. We know it today, don't we? We're in the area adjacent to the plaza outside, walking down some steps. This almost looks like a like an amphitheater you built out here. Exactly. It's the, it's the end of a large room, which is a community room that can seat a thousand people. Do you use this as an amphitheater? We have on a grand opening. It was used, and there's other events that are waiting to be scheduled. So people can because sit of this up feature. there to listen to concerts they can, they or whatever. They can sit, stand, use it, or just, just come up here and enjoy the, what this building has to offer. Yeah, because now we're going back into, I call this the grand room. I guess I, you've got a formal name for it, I'm sure. Actually, we don't have a name for it, but it is. It's this large exterior room that can only happen maybe in California or a climate like this. Now your lights are beginning to come on there. They are. They are. And this looks pretty impressive, these lights do, even in daylight. We're going to be in the shade. They're going to work all through the day. And um, we wanted the energy of a really active urban space, like you'd find in Mexico City or in Shibuya, Tokyo, or something like that. And an urban space that has a surprise in it. Yes. As you come closer to the end of the space and begin to enter the building, you realize there's a skylight, a big courtyard. And what it's going to do, it brings light all the way down to the ground. Wow, and, and lights all the interior offices as well. That's right. It connects us from floor to floor. You can be on any one of these floors and see your neighbor, your partners here at Caltrans interacting as they move or within their workspace. It brings us all together. Yeah, you can see people moving now, yeah? They're all... Yeah, so th are these hallways up here? Yes, yeah. All right, now here's, where's the front door? This is it, knowing that there's still some <laughs> still got a little bit of construction going on here, getting all the kinks out of the building. And we're going inside. Okay, we're inside the lobby, and right off the bat, it's a beautiful metal lobby. But leave it to Tom to come up with his own little take on what to do interesting with this space. You're referring to the ceiling. Yeah, I'm referring to the ceiling. <laughs> well, we've spent some time talking about transparency, and it's a continuation of that. You're looking at the, um, the conference room through the floor, and you're looking, of course, at the chairs now. There's no people in them, but you could imagine as they get inhabited, they're moving, they're dynamic. You're, you're literally so you're watching. you're seeing shadows move about when there are people there. Exactly. There's and things. it's like seeing, here we are waiting in a lobby for, for an elevator. You're seeing yourself in a way from underneath. It, it seems so alive and so, I don't know how you describe we're, we're it. We keep working with these same themes of randomness, of light, of uh, the use of light as a material. 
the wall is a light fixture in this case. Yeah. These are uh, these are fiberglass resin panels that were custom made for this job that we more or less invented prototype. You know, it's not a big lobby, but it's definitely a lobby that makes a statement. It does, it does. With these panels, the lights, and also a floating desk. Again, you don't see anything holding it up. Uh huh. You know, as we have our guards here, security check in as people come in. This is all perception of this floating desk with an informational panel. Uh, it's it, from the outside in, it's got everyone in awe. Well, let's go, let's get on the elevators, and that would open it up for us and head upstairs. You see about the size of the lobby? The notion was that the, uh, the exterior was the lobby. The big, the big room was the lobby, and this is the next lobby. So we've kind of breaking up, we're, we're trying to attack kind of even notions of the simplicity of a street and a lobby. There's actually a street and a courtyard and a second courtyard lobby room, and then the lobby. We're getting out of the elevator on the fourth floor, and there's a reason why we're on the fourth floor instead of the third or the fifth floor, isn't it? Because the elevator stops every three floors. It makes people uh, exercise, walk more. They walk up, walk down. It gives you this nice lobby, a two-story lobby. It's very efficient. We have a conference room below us where the lobby doesn't exist. And the, um, the whole notion of the efficiency of the elevator, think about a building this tall, it has one-third of the amount of stops. So wait a minute. It, it, you get off on the third floor. If your office was on the fourth floor, how do you get there? A little bit of leg work. Where, where are the steps? Where the are steps the steps right around the right. corner? So you get off. OK, here they are. And you walk to work. Now, how is this going down with the employees? The survey hasn't come in yet, but I think it, I believe it's a good thing. Well, it is a good thing. You know, it's one floor. OK, now we're on the, OK, we're looking down at the, the courtyard, the big room that we were just in below. This gives you a whole nother perspective over here. Exactly. We're on the bridge between the two halves of the building, and now we're looking over that public space. And we're looking up at this. This was that, that opening with the skylight, so we're looking up at the offices now. So I see what you're talking about. You can see the employees walking around and working up there. Exactly. Everything's transparent, and you're coming out, of course, on this side in the lobby, yes? And this is where the sun's coming through the courtyard, and this represents the, uh, the energy hub of the building, this, the social Boy, hub. there's a lot of use of, of light and, and openness in this building, isn't mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. It's California. The inside and outside want to become one. It really looks right down here. This is just a beautiful, beautiful view here. And something like this has got to motivate the employees, don't you think? I would hope so. That's what we're hoping. Yes, I, it, as people enjoy it, as they're interacting. They're interacting like they've never done before. With each other, with each other and with the building. With, with the building, each other, and increases productivity. Now we're ending up on the side of the building in an area that eventually will become our walking track for the employees. but. Tom, you brought us up here because this really, I mean, we're looking down the side of your building here, looking down across at Los Angeles, and this is really what gets your heart beating fast, isn't it? Yes, this is the, uh, this talks about the importance of the site and what an amazing site this is. But here we are with City Hall in the middle of the city, and of course, as you look around, you Keep, oh, you keep bringing up surprises, and for me, it's maybe reinterpreting. This one single idea of the skin keeps getting seen differently, and here it's a landscape, right? Well, it's here's a, the skin. Ground. Here's the skin right here. You've got an old building that's over 100 years old there, and then the modern skyline of L.A. These are the L.A. Times in the right, and this, here's the city in front of us, and this, is, this becomes the backdrop for the really understanding the view and the kind of location of the center of the city. Do you think most people, be honest with me now, do you think most people get this? I mean, you know, we don't all have the luxury of having the guided tour by the architect himself to explain the symbolism of all of this and the thought that went into the integration of all these forms and shapes into what this building is today. Everybody gets something different out of it. and. Um you would have to ask the public. I would say uh, my experience here is yes, they get it. And they all get it a little differently. They all see it the way they want to see it or the way they're trained to see it. 
or what their interests are. And it's what's so interesting about architecture is there is no correct way to look at it. Yeah. It operates on you however you see it and however it kind of stimulates you. You, you. Come on, you're a guy that's very interested and have asked all kinds of interesting questions and another person would ask another set of questions, yeah. don't you think? Yeah, but I'd never thought of this as skin before until you explained well, it to me. That's why I use the word skin, but you look at it and find it just intriguing for another reason. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. But when I say skin, you probably even think about it differently. Am I right? Yeah, and I'm looking at the way the light comes uh, through these. Yes, yes. It, it comes now through. It is transparent. It's really delicate, not quite so macho, maybe. A little softer. Yeah. yeah a little it more delicate. Closer, closer to the building. Yeah. It, it draws you in. And a lot of people ask the question, what is this? Why, how does that work? What does it serve? And they draw in closer and they start to appreciate it. This paneling is so interesting because at one point it looks almost solid and then you come over here and look, we're looking at the city through the skin. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? How it, it, how it transforms from solid to, to transparent. Depending on where the light is. That was our whole interest in the material. It's such a dynamic material, depending on how you see it, and it's continually changing in ways that none of us can even predict. I don't know how it works. Wow. Now, aren't these supposed to be closing up? They are. You can see them now. The top ones are all starting to close. The whole skin's going to close oh, down. Oh, they're closing. Yep. The sun is hitting it now. It closes down for efficiency from west sun. There's one right. Oh, the, on the top row there, they're closing. The whole top row's gone already. Here it goes. The next one are closing right now. Over the next uh, 10 minutes, the whole building will close up. And now it's going to be just a simple skin. Nothing. This really simple, continuous, I keep using the word skin. This, this right, the surface of the same panel you're talking about that you see through, just like we saw through the city. This is fun, isn't it? Kids, kids have to like this. <laughs> Buildings that move and, no? I'm having a ball. <laughs> Good. This is the way to end up our program right here after this wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much for taking us around. Thank you pleasure. very much. And and the lucky employees of Caltrans get to work in this building, but the rest of us get to walk by and see it and look at it. And hopefully now we all are looking at it and will appreciate it even more now that we know a little bit about the thought and the planning that went into to making this building. This is going to become on its own another architectural downtown landmark. Absolutely. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you very much. And I guess I could say this is our building. We own it, don't we? The taxpayers of California. State of California owns this building and everyone's welcome. Come visit it anytime. We own it and a beautiful building it is. We'll just stand here and watch the, the skin close up That's right. here in the afternoon sun in downtown Los Angeles. Well, it's one thing to talk about this beautiful building with the architect and with one of the head guys here, but as we were leaving, we ran into you. You're a Caltrans employee. You work in this building. What do you think about it? I think it's wonderful. I actually work on the 13th floor. Oh, so and you're the, way up there. Yes, sir, and the view is, as my son would say, awesomeism. That is awesomeism. That's a new word. Now, do you watch the, the shades open and close? Yes, sir, from time to time when I'm not at work, as I should be. Absolutely. <laughs> and what do you think about the architecture? Oh, it's, it's a little absolutely. different, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's, it's quite different. I was, um, I'm from California, although I was raised in New York, and I've never seen anything like it. We have tall buildings, but nothing to compare to this. Yeah, and you work here. Yes, sir, and I'm very proud to work here, too, as a Caltrans employee. There you have it, an unsolicited <laughs> testimonial it is. from, your name is? Robbie Miles. From Caltrans, and this is where she works every day. Visiting with Huell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation.
Visiting with Huell Hauser, made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. exciting day because look it's just 10 o'clock and they're already standing in line the lines are forming people are pushing to get in people love bugs people love bugs and i'm not even going to ask you about <laughs> your about your head gear here well you know you got to be uh, have a little bit of a bug theme it's the 22nd annual bug fair at the natural history museum of los angeles county all right now what is the bug fair grant what is that all about it's because i've heard a lot about this thing well it's a celebration of everything multi-legged i guess that's a little bit crunchy on the outside insects spiders scorpions millipedes centipedes you name it and this is a place where you will find specimens the the live uh, uh examples um, anything inspired by bugs whether they make it like honey and wax uh it's, it's uh, artwork, toys, T-shirts. Uh, we celebrate bugs, and, and you can see there's a lot of bug How did all this lovers. start? What was the idea behind having a bug fest, a bug fair? Well, I mean, it's one of the things. They're the most uh, successful group of organisms on the face of the planet. And yeah, it's but one, a lot of people get a little skittish when you start talking about bugs. The, and that's one of the problems. So we wanted to say they're pretty darn cool, and here's our chance to show the, the world. What is that one? Look at this. This is a uh, Mexican fire leg, or Brachypelma boemi, from northern uh, Mexico. That's a tarantula. This is a tarantula. Uh, it's eating right now. That's why it's in a strange position. It's chowing on a cricket as we speak. Oh, my God. But this one here oh. is a real nice little sweet lady. Oh, boy. This is Brachypelma albiceps, or the Mexican gold rump tarantula. Very, very sweet, very docile. You see the fangs are definitely still intact, but she just will not now, use I them. I know they don't bite, do they? Oh, they certainly can. There's some that we go down that end of the table and uh, we're asking for trouble. But what about this one? Can I put this one on my hand? She's just fine. Because look, this is one of life's great experiences, having a tarantula on your hand. From spiders to giant, uh, uh, forest uh, walking sticks. Walking sticks? Yes. Which are found where? Uh, these come from Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Indonesia. Wow. Uh, very, very large uh, walking sticks. Look at the size of these things. And they really do look like sticks. Yes. Very hard for predators to see them in the wild. Now, do you have people, oh, look at these over here. These are some more. These sticks are a little thicker. Oh, look up here. Yeah. These are giant cicadas. Oh my gosh. Yeah. What did... These are the biggest cicadas in the world. Oh gosh. Are... These aren't California cicadas, are they? No, again, those are from Malaysia, Thailand area. And look at these butterflies. Look at the size of this butterfly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, uh, that's a giant uh, atlas moth from Asia. And these are morpho butterflies from uh, Central and South America. Wow, you know, just displaying all of this is an art, isn't it? Are these yours? Yes. <laughs> oh, wow, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to grab them like that. Yeah, these are right. like collector's items, aren't Yes, they? they are. I'm a real regular. I have an 11-year-old in me that just can't stay away. Oh, they like to touch the worm. Yes, we do. They like to... Oof. We need to know, Dr. Sue, come on over here. What did this little baby just touch here? She touched a silkworm, a little larva caterpillar that's going to grow up to be a silk moth. Wow. And they're one of the softest things you could ever find on Earth, and so most of my students just love just petting them. Can I touch? Can Please, I pick? could I put one on your hand? I'm going to put sure. a nice big jumbo one here. Because there's an etiquette to the way you pick them up. That's isn't it? right. Gently but firmly. Gently but firmly. And then you let the silkworm hold on to you, and then 
it waves its head saying, hey, where's my breakfast? I was eating. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, this is great, so they're not afraid of bugs. Exactly. And and... She loves them. Yeah. It's kind of all the way that they're brought up as children, isn't it? The, what they're taught to be afraid of and what I they're agree. taught to respect. It's true. She And she loves all living things as a result. Boy, this thing is really so cool. holding on to me. I think I may have this one for the day. It it's would, really holding on. It would. It really doesn't want to fall off because it do, if it does fall off the tree, it'll starve to death because they don't, they're not strong enough to climb back up. Look at this. You take your finger and just pet it on the top, Michael. Isn't that so oh, soft? Oh, boy. Now, Ken Denton, a.k.a. Butterfly Man, waved us over here to his little booth over here because you wanted to point something out here, Ken. Well, I'm always winging it. And, you know, over here we have the California dog face Butterfly. You talk about California gold. Here is the official state butterfly. The of, official. The official state butterfly of California called the California dog face butterfly. That's now, the real how McCoy. Did it, how did it beat out all the other butterflies? Well, they went to a full session of the legislature. I believe it was about 1974. And this was the butterfly that they decided would represent California the best of all. And well, it's been that way ever since. Well, all the weighty issues facing our state, I'm glad that the legislature spent a day debating which butterfly should be our official one. That, I agree with you wholeheartedly. But here it is, the <laughs> official is. butterfly, yes, the California... Dog face butterfly. And if you look here, there's a little dog looking to the right and looking to the left. You get a silhouette, if you will, of a, of a little dog's face. And so they call it the dog face butterfly. And that's you learn something butterfly. new every day here at the bug fair. Now, what are you standing in line to buy here? Luna moths. Luna moths. Luna moths are eat off of the gum tree, and they're a green moth that are about this big. Well, let's see it. Well, we're gonna get it right here. Oh, it's right in there. Oh my gosh, how did you all get so excited about that particular moth? He is our bug expert. How did you become a bug expert? I just grew up that way. It's just something that grabbed you early on in life. You knew you liked bugs. Yeah. And have you saved up your money? Is this how, how expensive? He's been saving up for six months to come here. You're kidding. And then he'll start saving for the next one. Wow. That, this is his thing. His room is full of butterflies and frames, and he's got the Riker case. His, he's got the the big glass boxes. I forget what the Cornell yeah. boxes. He, this is his thing. He can tell you anything well, you want to know. Congratulations. What's your name? Philip. Nice to meet you, Philip. We're going to watch you get your moth here. So there it comes. Oh, look. Can you hold that out here so we can we see don't it? Want it to take off. No, no, you don't want it to be flying around. Look this this is a luna moth. This is Atticus Luna. They occur east of the Rockies. They do not eat as an adult. Okay, so you don't have to, they're very easy to take care of. Uh, they'll live about three to four weeks maximum. Well, wait a minute, this is only going to live three or four weeks. I don't really care. I just like to enjoy them. This is nature's party animal. They're only here for one reason. To party. It's, it's, yes, it's to, to, to reproduce. To reproduce. That's the only thing they're here for. Okay, this is the final end of the caterpillar. Reproduce, wow. propagation of the species. Well, there it is. You're going to take it home. You get to keep it for three weeks. It's going to reproduce. And then it dies. And then he'll frame it. Right, he'll pin it and frame it. Frame it. That way you have it forever. Yeah. Congratulations. This is a big day. Now, he's looking at bugs that aren't real. It doesn't make any difference to him. He just takes it all in. Real, not real. He loves bugs. Molly is the bat lady. Yes, I'm the bat lady. All right. Now, you've got the corner on bats here at the bug fair today. Get me excited. And I have never seen a bat up close before. Now that is something to see. 
Yes, it's exceptional. Um, every year we try to get something different for children and adults alike so that we can teach them about bats and their habitats and also what uh, wow. bats are good for. That's a big bat. Yes, these are wolf bats. Wolf bats. Mm -hmm. so Where are they found? Are they well, in California? Well, some of these are in California. There's different families are in California, but the, this particular one come from eastern Java, Indonesia. So, How hard is it to get these animals, these bats, into our country? Well, it is. You have uh, to have a special permit. Yeah, you do have. Are they, they're not endangered, are they? They're not they? endangered, but you have to have um, a wildlife preservation yeah. type of an, um, um, permits to have it come in. We don't want to do anything no, no, bad no, no, no. to animals no. all over. These the are all right. Everything that comes in here has to be um, um, permitted, and the museums, you know, they they're well known now for uh, the bat. Yeah. All right, we got bats. And that's one thing to look at bats, but look at this. These are vampire bats. Vampire bats that you can actually buy. You already pre-packaged, shrink wrapped, <laughs> ready to take home. Yes, they're actually air dried so that and it's well preserved. You can keep these for about 20 years or so. Well, what do people want to do with a bat? Would you buy a bat? Do you want to take a bat home? I, I don't have the money for a bat right now, but yeah, sure, I'd buy a bat. You want a bat? I don't think so. <laughs> now, this is a surprise. I have never seen anything like this in my life, Molly. What are we looking at? These are flying dragoons from Eastern Java as well. We have the red types and the yellow types. And flying what? Flying dragoons. They're flying dragons. They leap from tree to tree. They leap mm -hmm. from tree to tree. Right. They leap from tree to tree, so they don't usually um, go down. And on the floor, on the forest floor. These are the strangest looking things I've ever seen. Yes, they look very um, odd, but they're beautiful. Gorgeous wow. colors. Those are all natural colors. Josh is loaded down with what, Josh? Uh, this is a white armed African mantis. Uh huh. And, and what's in here? Uh, this is a a Arizona unicorn mantis. Wow. And what, is, what have you got in there? That's just food for him. So you're really into this, aren't you? Yeah, I come here every year for this stuff, so. And do you have a whole big collection at home? Not really, I just, I come here annually and just breed them, so. So you're breeding mantises? Yeah. What do you think about this? I think it's great. He probably has a, quite a collection. Because you all are just starting off, aren't you? Oh, you're yeah. still into we're, butterflies. We're beginners. So who knows where this could grow if you keep coming back every year? Exactly. It, it, sky's the limit. Yeah, it starts with the three butterflies here. Oh, I, got, I got a couple at home. Oh, you've already got some at home. And so he's got a big one. He's got a big giant a moth. Oh, wow. It's called the Atlas moth. So this is a whole family project. Oh, yeah. It's it's quite an event every year here. The kids love it, and the the parents learn a lot too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We yeah. learn a lot. And well, we got the moths right here. Uh huh. In the box, and these two are mine, and I think this one's mine. Oh, so these are for you? Yeah. Oh wow! It's a, it is the whole family involved in this. Mm, that's right. What does mom get out of this? Education. Oh boy, what are we looking at here? These are sea worms. Sea worms. Wonderful. Now, you all just got here. We sure did. We, we didn't expect this. You didn't expect something like this? No, we didn't. And I didn't expect her to hold them. What do you mean? You thought she'd be afraid? Yes. You're not afraid, are you? No. Boy, if she's not afraid of the sea worms, you're in for a lot of experiences in here today. Tell me. <laughs> this is just the beginning. <laughs> this is just the beginning. <laughs> you want to give him back his sea worms? No. You have to give him back. She's going to take him home. <laughs> no, we're not taking worms home. Look at this. <laughs> no, you can't keep them. <laughs> now, what are we looking at over here? What have we bought today? What is it, Natalie? Um, a hissing cockroach. A hissing cockroach. A hissing cockroach. Can we hold it? Want to hold it? You Can you put it in my hand? Yes. He's kind of squiggly, so here we go. Uh-oh. Here we go. 
Oh, uh -oh. my gosh. Oh, oh. <laughs> Do you want to hold it? Yes, yeah, she loves to hold it. You want to pick it up? Wow. There you go. Now, this is kind of interesting to see. She's so into this. Her mom and dad are wonderful naturalists, and they have taught her everything. Not to be afraid. They, they, they pick up worms, they hunt, they do wonderful things. And you're out with this. I'm is grandma. this your grandmother? Yeah. So She's now you're going to take them back home with a yeah. hissing cockroach. <laughs> Thanks, Grandma. Thank you. <laughs> now that is a look of total and complete fascination. If we saw this guy at home, I would be running so fast for a big shoe somewhere. <laughs> but he seems to be comfortable with it, so that's cool. Yeah, but you see, now that's how you change the way you your perspective. I think it's really all about the context, Jay. As long as we have a lot of people around that seem to, seem to think it's okay that we're holding these guys, then it's fine with me. Yeah, he's <laughs> fascinated by this. Yeah, he's really surprising me. When he sees an ant in the house, he turns and goes the other way. So this is a bit of a breakthrough for him. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now this is pushing the envelope right here. You know that, don't you? Um, yes, probably. Yeah, I mean, this thing looks fairly... This is not something most people would want crawling on their arm. Um, is that a centipede? Not. It is. It is a blue ring centipede. And are they poisonous? Are they dangerous? They, they are venomous, but this one's not really particularly bad. Look at this thing. Boy, it just comes right. Oh my gosh. Is that a big centipede? It's about medium sized. People must freak out when they see this. Some Who wants to hold the centipede? <laughs> not a single person put their hands up. It's probably not a good idea. It bites randomly. What? It, he, he knows better than anybody. It, it <laughs> randomly bites people? So she's one of our group members, so if it bites her, it's not as big of a deal. Yeah, if it bites one of them, <laughs> then it's a big deal. It's a lawsuit. Yeah. So, and the, the longer she's out and the warmer she gets, the more likely she is to bite. I'm moving away. Thank you very much. So much for the centipede. How did you get into praying mantis? We see them in our house all the time when I'm working in the yard. And uh, like I was telling the lady here, you know, she says they make great pets and never even realized it. Wait a minute. Praying mantis make good pets? Absolutely they do, because uh, people have this image that they're ferocious, but actually they're only ferocious when they eat. Mm -hmm. uh, as pets, they're really docile, they just kind of sit around. But how could you have a pet praying mantis? You know what? We got ours as a fluke. My boyfriend brought them home one day, and I was scared to death. I said, get that thing out of here! And he goes, no, 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 watch, watch. One day, he just starts letting him walk around all his arm, all over his arm, and they love people. Now, this is a teeny, teeny, teeny. Is this a baby? That's a baby born this year in April. And what would people do? Take this home and... Uh -huh. Take this home, play, uh, play with it. They hop around, watch them grow. They grow up to about three to four inches. You're the grandmother, and you were telling me that your grandson knows everything there is to know about these bugs. Yes, he does. Tell me something about the bugs. Um, they're, not, they, they're not spiders. And spiders have six... They have eight legs, and they're not insects. Spiders aren't insects. And they and scorpions are not into cedar because they have like this legs. This They're, many legs. Yeah, they have that many legs. Boy, he does know, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He does. Where does he learn that? Well, mom and pop are both uh, uh, teachers, and they buy a lot of videos, a lot of the nature, uh, National Geographic things. You better yeah. watch him. He's hey. he's got his eye on something. Yes, he does. He loves to touch them all. Your son is standing here, totally into this. <laughs> he's so excited about coming here, and the first thing he does is it does is run into a big giant bug like that. He'll it's a memory's gonna laugh a lifetime for him. So he's been talking about this. Oh yeah, his teacher who was somewhere nearby. Yeah. Has told him a uh, time and time we have to come see the bugs, and he's excited about eating a bug and holding a bug as he's doing now. Although I'm a little apprehensive, I'm watching him. <laughs> but good for him, good for him. It's okay. Yeah, I see that, I see that. Yeah. How does it feel? Is that a scorpion? Feel pretty good? No. <laughs> what are we looking at? We're looking at a giant African emperor scorpion. 
Oh my, now listen, scorpions, you shouldn't be holding the scorpions, should you? Uh, generally, no, as a rule of thumb, you shouldn't hold any scorpions, but these are a common pester variety. Uh, so has it been defanged? Has it oh, been no, no. poisoned? No, D, D, well, there's no fangs on this, but uh, they got a telson here, this little stinger here on, on the end. Look at this thing. And, uh, that stinger's all curled up and ready to sting. Yeah, you generally don't want to remove any stinger or any fang from spiders or stingers from scorpions because that's what they need to survive. So how do you know that this here, ladies, take a close look. How do you know this isn't going to bite? Oh, look. Now what I'm using here is an ultraviolet light. They have a special pigmentation in their exoskeleton that causes them to glow under UV. Wow, or look black at light. it. I hope the camera can pick that up. It's glowing. Yeah, it glows, glows bright, bright uh, green. People are fascinated by scorpions, aren't they? Yeah, they're a mystery, that's why. <laughs> yeah, well, just the name scorpion. Scorpion, it's a cool name. Scorpio, the, the coolest zodiac sign. <laughs> You got your daughter in one hand and bugs in the bugs other. Bugs in the other. Can I open this up? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, boy. <laughs> you have got bugs. <laughs> what are we looking at here? Uh, beetles. So are you a beetle man? Uh, I am a beetle man, a beetle and babies. Be beetles and babies. <laughs> so how did you become a beetle man? Um, I just think they're beautiful. They're yeah. amazing. So I've always loved them. And and how do you display these? Uh, my wife's going to put together an artistic framing and put it above our mantle. So you're going to have beetles over the mantle? Mm -hmm. We will. <laughs> they just made a purchase. They just made a purchase. What did you buy, boys? I got a golden striped tarantula. A golden striped tarantula? And what did you get? I'm about to get a red knee tarantula. Oh, wow. Now, who's the biggest bug? Well, we're both like reptiles and bugs. We do a reptile show for like preschoolers. Oh, really? You're so, already putting on shows for younger kids. Yeah, so we're just so. getting some... Uh, some spiders and some cool stuff for the kids. Yeah, you know what? It's exciting to see them excited at their age, isn't it? It, it is, and we have a house full of reptiles. Oh. Yeah. What kind of reptiles? I got a red-tailed boa, ball python, a corn snake, and dumpy tree frog, and two red-eyed tree frogs. In your house? Yes. I have a bearded dragon, two dumpy tree frogs, a flat rock scorpion, and a children's python. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You all are into, uh, yeah, into this, aren't you? Yeah, we, we have a passion for reptiles. It's, it's, it's fun. Adelia is standing here with her scorpion, with her pet scorpion. Mom, right. when you all arrived at the bug fair today, did you know that this purchase was going to be made? Um, I knew that there would be purchases. I didn't think it would be this one. A scorpion. A scorpion. Had money been saved over the year for these purchases? How much money did you bring with you today? $92. So you've been saving up all year? Um, well, I saved up a lot more, but yeah, I've been saving. Just to buy something like this scorpion? Yeah. I was planning on a horse, but then I changed my mind. <laughs> what have you got here? Actually, this guy is. Uh, I can't we can even find see him. anything in there. There he is. He's right up here. He's a nymph assassin bug. Wait a minute. A what? A nymph assassin bug, right, Felix? A nymph. A nymph assassin, assassin bug. bug. Mm -hmm. And what do they do? Um, they assassinate their prey. We have a curly-haired tarantula. A curly-haired tarantula. Uh -huh, it's I like she was that big, and now she's this big. Yeah. How much bigger is she going to get? I think she might get about that big. Wow. And yes. this is OK? Oh, yeah. It's OK with me as long as it's in their house, not in <laughs> I'm the grandma. Uh, <laughs> and it, we have to like keep her away, like put away, because we have cats also in the same house. Because yeah. tarantulas and cats yes. don't really. No, One time they I do. took her out in the bathroom, and she almost went down the shower drain. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so it's kind of, you have to really be on your toes to have a tarantula around mm -hmm. the house. Yeah. And um, Does she have a name? Yeah, her name is Sally. Yeah. She isn't really eating the crickets right now, so we think she's going to uh, molt soon. Now, we've been seeing all these exotic bugs and bats and butterflies from all over the world, but we've got our own L.A. 
bugs, don't we? Yeah, we've got a surprising diversity here. People wouldn't expect it. And you've yeah. got a whole organization. Yep. What is this called? What is it? Scabies is Southern California Arachnid Bug Invertebrate Entomological Society. Boy, that just rolls right yeah. off the tongue. So smooth. And you get a <laughs> lot of people excited about local bugs, don't you? Yeah, because people, you know, you grow up here and you grow up in the city, you'd never know that we have native tarantulas, scorpions, giant centipedes, think that, things that you think only grow up in the tropics. Our own LA. Our own centipedes. LA. Our own LA centipedes. Our own LA scorpions. Our own LA scorpions, definitely. Yeah. Our own LA, that's not a local tarantula. Uh, it's, it's off of the I-5, it's Los Angeles County, definitely. <laughs> well, we're ending up by hooking back up with Brent the Bug Man. And Brent, I gotta tell you, we have had an amazing day because not only have we seen a lot of bugs and touched a lot of spiders and all of that sort of thing, but we've met a lot of nice people, young and old, who really have a great interest in and a healthy respect for bugs. And that's really what it's all about. You know, we're out there too, and there are a lot of people who do respect those little critters that run across the sidewalk and don't just want to step on them when they see them. There's yeah. actually some sorts of interest there. So is that what this thing is really all about, to just, in, you know, increase our awareness and respect for bugs? Sure, and that's what we do here at the Natural History Museum. We take natural history, we exhibit it in a way that will hopefully get people a little bit more interested in the world around them and get them to observe the stuff around them, and that's what the bug fair is uh, about. Well, it's an annual event. Yes, every year, third weekend in May. A lot of these kids save up their money all year round to yeah. come here to buy bugs. Yeah, they've had that the vision of that butterfly in their head all year, and now they're here to finally get that it. that so. tarantula or that scorpion. Or that millipede or centipede, you bet, and it's all here. Wow, it is all here. A lot of positive energy here. I'm worn out. <laughs> you still got a day and a half of this to go. Oh, we're going to do the best we can to make it. But these buggy people. The good news is at the end of the weekend, I get to hide myself in the crevice somewhere like a cockroach and just hide out until next year. He's been around bugs way too long. Thanks a lot. Thank you all so much we for coming. We have had a wonderful day here at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles okay. County. You got it. At their annual bug fair. It's buggy, all right, but in a very good way.